Good evening. Uh, I'd like to begin as we always begin. As a Muslim, we always start all of our meetings acknowledging God. So I'd like to say in the name of Almighty God, Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the revealer of all truth, the sender of all prophets, I bear witness that there's no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. I'm a student of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and as such, we thank Almighty God for intervening in our affairs and raising up one from among us to lead and teach us. We acknowledge that one as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In their names, I greet you in the universal greeting words of peace and paradise, as we say it in the Arabic language, Aslam alaikum. For those who are unfamiliar, those greetings simply means peace be unto you. And so we want to welcome you all this evening up here to Grove Hall, uh, where we are getting ready to hear from Christopher Bolin, dealing with 9-11 truth and dealing with what really happened during 9-11. So we are hearing this event is being sponsored by the local organizing committee of Boston, the local organizing committee of the Millions More Movement and the Justice or Else Movement. But we felt it important and necessary to sponsor this event. Um, Christopher Bolin, we got a chance to meet him earlier this year when he came to our Savior's Day convention in Detroit. And he did a, pre a presentation, a workshop on 9-11 Truth. And so the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan had invited Christopher Bolin as he invited other uh, scientists, uh, architects and engineers to come and share what they know uh, of the facts of what happened in 9-11. And so that was a very powerful presentation. And this is a very powerful presentation that you're about to see and hear today. So when last month, I think it was, Christopher Bolin was in town at a water town and we went to that presentation over there and i felt that it would be a great opportunity to have chris to come and to speak in the heart of the black community right here in uptown grove hall uh because this is a this is a subject that's very important really for all of us all of us as americans should want to know the truth of what happened in 9-11 9 11 as as christopher bonham will get into has been uh has triggered and has been the pretext for america's longest standing war and i believe the most expensive war uh that has caused the invasion of several muslim countries the invasion of muslim countries killing hundreds of thousands of people including thousands of americans that have been murdered not only in the initial act of the towers coming down but all of those soldiers that have went you know in good faith to fight uh to defend and to do what they believe is making america safe but all of these wars and all of these lives that have been lost as we will see today has been on the base of a false pretext and so it's in all of our best interest to learn the truth of what happened in 9 11 because as I said in Watertown when I spoke, that the facts that we're gonna see is so horrific to think of how many, how many lives were lost and what's the real purpose behind those lives being lost. It is really a devastating thing. And what's horrible is that these crimes are being committed in our name, in the name of the American citizens who don't really know what's really behind these walls, but it is our tax dollars that's funding these wars. It is our relatives, our children, our brothers, our sisters that are going and losing their lives and they don't even know what they're fighting for. So it's, it's important for us to come and to get this information. And so we wanted to bring Christopher here to just offer another opportunity and I'll say specifically to the Muslim community. This is important for us because Islam and Muslims have been scapegoated and have been the target of harassment, discrimination, and abuse on a false pretext. So as Muslims, we should be interested in learning the truth of what happened in 9-11 so that we can spread the word that, that 
those of our American citizens may know the truth that the vilification and we can stop being scapegoated for something that we had nothing to do with. So with that, it is an honor for me to have to be here and it's an honor for me to have you here. I'm glad and thank each and every one of you for coming. I hope that you would open your minds, open your hearts and listen to what Christopher has to say. He met with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and I'll let him tell that story. Mm -hmm. But we thank him. Help me to receive him with a warm round of applause, Christopher Bolin. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Sound? Turn that sound up for the room. Homuk? Okay, testing. Can you hear me back there in the back row? Is the sound, lift the sound up a little bit more. Homuk, the sound of a little bit more. The, the, the sound for the, okay, that's better. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christopher Bolin. Uh, this is the final presentation of the tour that I've been on for the last uh, seven weeks. Um, the tour is called Making Sense of the War on Terror. And as they say in Arabic and greeting, salam alaikum, it means peace. But the Islamic concept of peace entails much more than just an absence of hostilities. It means an absence of injustice as well. And the thing is, 9-11 has brought great injustice to the world. Um, Minister Farrakhan refers to 9-11 and, and the war on terror as being a war against Islam. Right. And he's right. It's not just that Muslims in this country or other countries have been scapegoated. Islamic nations are also targeted. And in this war on terror, we have already destroyed, laid waste to something like a half a dozen Islamic states. And many Americans just realized a couple days ago that uh, American troops were killed in a place called Niger, in the Sahara Desert, South Central, Central Africa, North, middle of the Sahara. And um, CNN and Fox News are talking about what the representative in Florida said, what she heard on the phone call, and what Trump said on the phone call. But very little is talked about why are American troops fighting in Niger in the first place? What's going on? And the truth be known, American troops are fighting between 60 and 80 countries all across Africa. They're in Mali, they're in Cameroon, they're in Senegal, they're in Guinea-Bissau, they're everywhere. And what are they doing? And we're told, we're told these are heroes, these men that died. Of course they're heroes, they're heroes defending American freedom. How are they defending American freedom in Niger? Well, I'll get into that. What is the war on terror? This, this my presentation, here I am protesting outside the Oscars a couple years ago. Solving 9-11 ends the war is my banner. But the thing is, you have to understand that the solution to the war on terror is 9-11 truth. Because the deception of 9-11 and the deception of the war on terror are two halves of the same coin. And it's a counterfeit coin. It's a fraudulent coin. I was an investigative journalist in Washington, D.C. when 9-11 happened. I wrote for a weekly newspaper. I have a degree in, in history, in Middle East. My specialty was Israel and Palestine from the University of California. I'm the author of the Solving 9-11 set of books. And prior to all of that, I, was, I grew up in, outside Chicago in a place called Schaumburg, Illinois, where I was an Eagle Scout, and I earned the God and Country Award. And uh, here I am presenting evidence, if you can see, at the first grand jury solving the 9-11 crime in Los Angeles in 2004. The Solving 9-11 set of books, which are my, my big work on 9-11, this work took me uh, the better part of a, no, more than a decade to finish. Um, this book is Solving 9-11, The Deception That Changed the World. This is my analysis of the 9-11 crime in chapter format. And what I do in the Solving 9-11 set of books is I, I, I ask the question, who is behind 9-11 and why was it done? It didn't just fall out of the blue sky and it certainly wasn't Muslims from Afghanistan who did it. So understanding who's behind the, the war on terror and who benefits from it is essential to understanding the deception. The larger book, Solving 9-11, the original articles, contains my uh, 11 years of, of research articles in chronological order. So if you read this uh, article by article, you will see how the, how the thesis builds on the evidence. My, my newest book is this little book 
called The War on Terror. It's a small book, and uh, it's meant to be like a pamphlet. It's very easily read, and it's, uh, it reads like a breeze, because it's very important that Americans understand the deception of the war on terror. I see a lot of people who say, end the war, you know, call for an end of the war, but if you don't understand the cause of the war, if you don't understand who's behind the war, if you don't understand the strategic plan underlying the war, you have no chance of, of stopping it. 9-11 um, was blamed on Muslims in order to initiate the war on terror. That's the policy coup. Behind the war on terror, there's a strategic plan, not an American plan, to redraw the map of the Middle East. Recognizing the origin of the plan is crucial, is essential to comprehending the deception that has changed our world. And if you've been to an airport lately, and you remember what it used to be like to fly before 2001, you know how our, our reality has changed. The common origin of the 9-11 and war on terror plots are that they were both conceived by Israeli military intelligence, not Mossad, military intelligence in the late 1970s under the leadership of Menachem Begin. When Menachem Begin came to power, Menachem Begin is the notorious Zionist terrorist of the 1940s who was in charge of the Irgun. So 9-11 was a false flag terror atrocity meant to be blamed on Muslims and create fear and rage to get U.S. public opinion to support the war on terror, a pre-planned Zionist war agenda to be waged under the pretext of fighting terrorism. And if you look at what's going on today in Syria and Iraq, where Operation Inherent Resolve is the United States with 68 allied nations fighting ISIS. They've just, they've just finished Raqqa in Syria, and they finished Mosul about a month ago. And our media has not shown us anything about the devastation of Mosul and Raqqa. They showed us a lot about the devastation in, in Aleppo, when the Russians and, and the Syrians were, were, were liberating Aleppo from the clutches of the ISIS group. But what's been done in, in Alep, what's been done in Raqqa and Mosul is, is as bad. The Russians have said just, just yesterday that the barbaric bombing of, of Raqqa is comparable to the bombing of Dresden. So you can see it's a very, very uh, devastating war that's being fought of ethnic cleansing. Three quarters of the population of Raqqa has been removed, and Mosul probably the same under the pretext of fighting ISIS. And of course, the, Syrians, the Syrian government doesn't want the American military there, but the American military says, wait, we're fighting ISIS, so we're gonna go into your country whether you like it or not. So starting the war on, on terror was the primary reason for 9-11. 9-11 was a policy coup that brought us the war on terror and a series of costly wars. This grim photograph is from Iraq. Now, the war on terror is based on the 9-11 lie, the lie of what happened on 9-11. And unfortunately, our new president has reiterated that lie most recently on August 21st when he spoke about Afghanistan. And he said that 9-11, the worst terrorist attack in our history, was planned and directed from Afghanistan. That's a complete lie. It was not planned or carried out from Afghanistan. But when Donald Trump reiterates this, and says this publicly, he's saying that he is going along with the war on terror. That means that we now have a continuation of the policies of George Bush and Barack Obama when we're talking about the war on terror and the war in the Middle East. Now, Wesley Clark was, this man was a four-star general. He was running for president in 2007, and he spoke, he was the supreme allied commander in Europe in the 1990s when the United States and NATO broke up Yugoslavia in something called balkanization. It broke Yugoslavia up into seven little, little countries. He said in San Francisco in 2007, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, if you're an American, you ought to be concerned about the strategy of the United States in this region. What is our aim? What is our purpose? Why are we there? Why are Americans dying in this region? That is the issue. And that is the issue today as it was 10 years ago when he spoke these words. Americans are still dying in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and Niger, and many other countries. He went on to say, what happened on 9-11 is that we didn't have a strategy. We didn't have bipartisan agreement. We didn't have American understanding of it. And we had instead a policy coup in this country, a coup, a policy coup. 
Some hard-nosed people took over the direction of American policy, and they never bothered to inform the rest of us. When Wesley Clark forced our general from the Pentagon and says we didn't have American understanding of it, he's saying, he's implying, he's hinting that we had non-American understanding of 9-11. So what's he talking about? French understanding? Japanese understanding? He's talking about Israeli understanding. The interpretation of 9-11 came to us from Israeli military. People like Ehud Barak and Benjamin Netanyahu. Here's Benjamin Netanyahu speaking the day after 9-11 in Jerusalem. He said, we must build a coalition against terror today. It's time to take on militant Islamic regimes with a great deal of strength. We should crush the terrorist infrastructure that threatens the entire free world. Now, if we look at the, at the Operation Inherent Resolve, that's currently the war on terror in Iraq and Syria against ISIS, you will see a banner of 67 or 68 nations with their flags who are involved in this operation. But you will not find the Israeli flag. Where are the Israelis in this coalition? They're running the coalition. They're running the operation. They're part of it. They're the guys at the top, and you're not seeing the Israeli flag. But now Netanyahu, although he grew up in New York, and his dad taught at Cornell, he's not very sympathetic to the United States. It may be his, his time spent with the Rothschilds that they tainted his thinking. He was overheard saying um, in 2005, once we squeeze all we can out of the United States, it can dry up and blow away. So he's not very sympathetic to the plight of America. Now, when we talk about Zionist interpretation of 9-11, here we see the Defense Policy Board, three of the members, we have Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, Comptroller of the Pentagon, Dub Zakheim, and Douglas Feith over here, the son of an Irgun fighter. And they're speaking at the Pentagon in 2002, January, with the, the Israeli Chief of Staff, Shaul Mofaz, who's wearing this, the, the red beret of the Sayeret Matkal on his shoulder here. And they're talking about the American defense policy, because these are the men who crafted, these are called the Zionist neocons at the time. These are the men who crafted the policy that the Pentagon put into effect as a result of 9-11. And what was that policy? Again, Wesley Clark said, about 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. One of the generals called me in. He said, sir, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. We're going to war with Iraq, I said, why? I don't know, he said. I came back a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? He said, sir, it's much worse than that. We're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. And if you look at that shopping list of seven countries, Six of them have already been done. So this is a pretty accurate prognosis of what was, the, what was the plan. This is the memo that he saw. And he didn't really know where this memo came from. He certainly didn't know where this strategy came from. Where did this come from? This is not an American strategy. There is no, Amer there is no American interest in doing this. So the question is, where did it come from? Well, this is the implementation of an old Israeli plan called the Yanon Plan. It's named the Yanon Plan because it was written by a man named Oded Yanon in 1982, who was a strategist for the Israeli military. And it was called Israel's Master Plan to Dominate the Middle East. And it was, it was translated for the benefit of the non-Hebrew speaking wor world by a, man, a great professor named Israel Shahak, who taught chemistry at Hebrew University. And Israel Shahak would translate documents that he thought were important for the outside world to know because he was a critic of, of the, the Zionist radical plans. And he translated the Yanon plan. He said that the Yanon plan represents the accurate and detailed plan of the present Zionist regime, which was Likud at the time, as it is today, for the Middle East, which is based on the division of the whole area into small states and the dissolution, the breaking up of all the existing Arab states. And that is, in a nutshell, the strategy behind the war on terror. And as you can see, to, just in the last week or two, September 25th, there was a vote in the northern part of Iraq, here, the blue section of Iraq, that's called Kurdistan, that's the Kurdish area. And they voted for independence. And the country that's pushing this plan for independence of Kurdistan is Israel. Israel's been training the Kurds for decades, 
And the United States, the US troops in Iraq, most of them are fighting with what they call the Syrian Democratic Forces up here. And what they did is they expanded very much, they expanded the area of the Kurdish area, multiplied it by about three, and then voted for independence, which has led to a war with Iraq. Now Iraqi troops are claiming back, they want, they want Kirkuk back because Kirkuk represents a significant amount of the oil of Iraq. So this is the Yenon plan. And, it, and as you see, they've, they've succeeded in breaking up Libya already. That's a done deal. Syria is only, con is only still a, a, a contiguous state thanks to the presence of the Russian military and the help of the Iranian government. Were, were the Russians not there, Syria would not be a country anymore for the last few years. It would have been broken up. And that would benefit Israel because Israel has annexed the Golan Heights in the southern part of Syria, right about here. And if Syria were broken up and there were no longer a return address for Syria, then there's nobody to claim the Golan Heights. And Israel would be able to keep all that water and oil that is in the Golan. Here is the ethnic divisions of these states. The north is Kurdish. This is the Sunni area. And down here is the Shiite area of Iraq. And Syria is much more a patchwork quilt of various confessions and, and, and uh, tribes. But it says here, this is a Yanon quote from the, from the Yanon plan. It says, the dissolution of Syria and Iraq is Israel's primary target on the Eastern Front. The dissolution of the military power of those states serves as the primary short-term target. Now, when the United States military went into Iraq in 2003 during the occupation phase of the war, which had been going on for already 10 years at the point, at that point, 12 years, what was the first thing the American military did? Do you remember? They disbanded the Iraqi military and they sent all the Iraqi military officers, enlisted men, home without a paycheck. Your career military is finished. This is exactly what the Israelis wanted. Because when you break up, the, when you break up the, the armies of Iraq or Syria, then you break up the fabric that holds it together. Now, the oil in northern Iraq, this is what we're talking about. Here's northern Iraq, here's Kirkuk. This is where the Iraqi army just is, is, is fighting against the Kurds right now here, taking back Kirkuk. Because the original part of the Kurdish area is about here in the north. And they greatly expanded their area immensely in the last couple of years. Oil in northern Iraq lies mainly in the Kurdish areas. Janel Energy, a Rothschild company, is the largest holder of reserves in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. And what they're doing, what they've been doing for the last few years, is with, with the help of the American military and the Israelis, they've been piping the oil from here into Turkey, across Turkey to Chehan, and then the oil goes down to Israel because it's stolen oil and no other country will buy it. But Israel will buy it and then sell it on to somebody else. It's like oil laundering. Now, in the Kurdish area, which is going to, you'll hear a lot more about that in the news in the coming weeks because there's a war developing there between Iraq and Kurdistan. It's headed by this man. His name is Masoud Barzani. He's been the unelected leader of that country for the last four years. His father here is Mustafa Barzani, and in this photograph from 1966, he's talking to the head of the Mossad, this man here. Two years later, in 1968, here he is visiting with Moshe Dayan in Israel. And so the Israelis have been working very closely with the Kurds since the 1960s. It's part of their strategy to cultivate the non-Arabic ethnic groups in the Middle East to turn against the Arab groups, to cause, you know, dissent and, and conflict within the Arab countries. And here you see a recent, a rather recent rally for Kurdish independence in Erbil. And here you see the Kurdish flag flying alongside the Israeli flag. Because the Israelis have been helping and training the Peshmerga for decades. And the Israelis are the only country, Netanyahu is the only country that supports this Kurdish independence because it is the Israeli plan. America, the United States of America, although we were helping create this plan, we, the, the position of the U.S. government is that we don't support Kurdish independence. That's the official position. It's a difference between what people say and what they do. Eh? Uh, so this is 9-11, the day after 9-11. We got this very basic story that Alibaba and 40 thieves hijacked planes, flew into the Twin, set, twin Towers, destroyed the Twin Towers with their planes, and, and hit the Pentagon in a day of terror. So the media has imposed on, the, on us, the public, a false story, a false narrative, that radical Islamic terrorists are to blame for 9-11. Now, this has been the story for the last 16 years. And this country has now fought 
the longest war in U.S. history, 16 years. But if you, if you consider that the war in, in Iraq has been going on since 1991, it's even longer. That's even longer. But they, they, don't, they don't count the sanction period in between. But the point is, is that we have been living under this war on terror, false narrative, zeitgeist, for 16 years. We've gone to war and we have spent more money in this war than any other war in U.S. history. More than World War II, at least two and a half trillion dollars already spent of borrowed money. The only way to liberate ourselves and our nations from this madness is to expose the true source of the terrorism. And in, a war, in the war of terrorism, the main tool is fear. And what they want to, what they want to you know, impose on the public is a, is a public sense of fear. So that when people are fearful, they will go along with the policies that are meant to alleviate that fear, usually war policies. Now, the way they did it is that the way they avoided any investigation is that on 9-11, the Bush administration declared 9-11 to be an act of war. This is USA Today the next day. And this is the headline of the paper of USA Today, the, the CIA paper coming out of you know, the CIA offices. And the reason why this is so prominent is because an act of war is a very important legal term. It meant, in practical terms, that 9-11 would not be investigated as a crime. They would not investigate the evidence. They would not prosecute the guilty in a court of law and put them in jail or, or sentence them to prison. No, it wasn't going to be like that. An act of war meant that this, this mass murder atrocity was done by another nation and we would wage war against that nation or those nations that the president decided was, res was responsible. And it was given under the authorization to use military force. It was under the, the president's sole discretion to wage war wherever he saw fit to seek revenge for 9-11. He didn't have to provide any evidence. As you see, he didn't in Iraq and Afghanistan. He never provided any evidence that Afghan was behind 9-11 or that Iraq was behind 9-11. He didn't need to. So that was all just window dressing. He, and, and since then, we've gone to war in many countries. We're waging war in Yemen under this authorization of military force. We're waging war in Niger under the same, under the same authorization of military force. And when Barbara Lee, a congressman, congress lady from, from California, succeeded after 10 years in getting the amendment in for the Congress should re-examine the authorization of use military force, the next night at midnight, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, ripped it out of the bill completely on his own, he said it doesn't belong there. So we're not getting any congressional de 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 debate on this at all. Uh, Rand Paul tried to offer some debate and he, he, was, he was doing a sit down in the Congress to try and get Congress to address this because our nation has been at war in dozens of countries waging war around the world and Congress has absolutely no say in it. And we have no say in it. But our children are sent there. We're paying for it. The cost of this war will be a burden on our children and our grandchildren. Well, so the, this uh, Larry Johnson from the, um, he was deputy director of counterterrorism. He said that, that these guys that they blamed, these 19 hijackers, alleged hijackers, he said these guys were not decision makers in any way. They were basically patsies. And he said, we don't have anything in history to compare with this. The only thing that comes close to it is a former Soviet intelligence operation. Now I'm going to show you some of the evidence that will dispel any idea that this was done by people from Afghanistan. The first plane hit the, Pentagon, hit the World Trade Center Tower 1 at 8.45, 8.46 in the morning. And here you see the plane, if you, if you can see the slide, the plane came in the north side and both planes went into secure computer rooms. They went into rooms, into floors that were occupied by large boxes of computer equipment, big servers, rows and racks and racks of computers, and no people, no desks, no secretaries, and also big boxes of black heavy boxes that were said to be batteries, but were never plugged in. The first one went into the computer room of Marsh McLennan Company, which was headed by Maurice Greenberg's son, Jeffrey. What's interesting to note here is that this, this company was affiliated with a company that had security for the World Trade Center. The first plane went into their computer room, and one of their employees was a man named Jerry Bremer, who went on to be the pro-counsel, the, the, the head of Iraq 
for the first three years of the occupation until July of 2004. Now the second plane, if you can see this, the second plane is just about to hit the South Tower. It said that this plane was Flight 175, United Airlines, but it doesn't appear to be Flight 175. The bottom of the plane is not dark blue as United was. There's a groove down the middle of the plane, which is indicative of a, a Boeing 6767 tanker aircraft. And the plane has been weaponized. This plane has been weaponized with something like a missile right under the fuselage by the right wing there. So that's not Flight 175. And just before the plane impacted the wall of the tower, it, it fired a missile. And that missile entered the building just before the plane did. Now, this is a very important slide. I hope you can see it. That's the side of the building. And here's this white hot hole about, this, about the diameter of the fuselage of the plane. And the nose of the plane is, is coming here. So just before the plane hit the building, this missile opened up a, a hot, white hot hole, which facilitated the entry of the plane into the building. And most likely, this was created by something called a DU warhead, a uranium warhead, which is commonly used in the United States military to penetrate hardened targets like tanks. And here we see an explosion coming from the place where the, where the plane entered. This plane entered in this direction and came out this side, whatever came out. And here we see the burning kerosene, but here we see an explosion coming out the entry wound of the, of the building. And here we see the, the ex mighty explosion that, that followed the, the, the plane going through. So here we see this white smoke, this white smoke, this looks like aluminum oxide, very similar to the, the things that you see in those artificial clouds above, aluminum oxide. That's what's created when thermite detonates. Now, I'd studied, I'd written a lot of articles, about half a dozen articles about depleted uranium. And I'd studied depleted uranium in, at Livermore with a, a man who was a scientist who was from the um, Manhattan Project all the way through to Star Wars. And I said, well, if a, if a DU warhead went in the building, it must come out the building because it goes through anything. And lo and behold, there we see that little critter coming out over here behind that pole, burning white hot coming very fast. That's not part of the aircraft. And here against that, we had a clear blue sky that day. No chemtrails that day. And here we see this white hot image, this extremely white burning object, leaving a trail of dark oxides. Well, a DU warhead, uranium warhead, is pyrophoric. That means it burns in the air. Uranium ignites spontaneously and burns at temperatures above 6,000 degrees Celsius. Extremely hot. So with that in incredible heat and density, it is a perfect armor-piercing incendiary weapon with the one drawback that it contaminates regions with uranium for thousands of years. So its use in places like Iraq has contaminated places like Basra for a long, long time. So they have terrible birth defects down there. And many of the American troops who came back from service in Iraq in 1991 suffered lots of uh, very severe birth defects in their children. And here again, we see this white hot object coming out with great momentum. So I contacted Marion Falk, the late Marion Falk, who was my scientist friend at Lawrence Livermore, and I asked him, does this object have the characteristics of a burning DU warhead? And he said, yes, it does. See, it's burning so hot that the oxides have to cool before they become visible. And here's the South Tower just before it fell, or just as it began to fall. The top 30 floors, the top 30 floors toppled. But rather than falling to the street, or crushing the part below, they were pulverized in midair. Here you see what happened. It, it, as it toppled, rather than falling, it simply disintegrated in one big black poof. So it, wasn't, it was not crushing the building as it went down, nor had it fallen. So you see, what happened on 9-11 to these towers is that they were, they were demolished from the top down at basically free fall speed. So both towers fell at the speed at which an object would fall to the ground. If you dropped a rock from 415 meters high, it would hit the ground in 10 seconds. These buildings fell. One of them fell in less than 10 seconds. It's not possible. And this is, this is the comments of uh, Van Romero. He's an expert on explosives and buildings at a place called New Mexico Tech. And he was, he was in Washington, D.C. that day. And he, said, my, he called the Albuquerque Journal and said, my opinion is, based on the videotapes, that after the airplanes hit the World Trade Center, there were some explosive devices inside the buildings that caused the towers to collapse. It would be difficult for something from the plane to trigger an event like that. 
So he said there were explosions, there were bombs in the building, and he was pretty correct. Anybody could see that. Any child could see that the buildings are being exploded laterally. It's going shooting sideways. Um, there was one other man who said that day on 9-11 that, that he thought bombs went off simultaneously with the planes hitting the building. You know who that was? Donald Trump. Donald Trump on 9-11 was interviewed, and he said that, in his opinion, bombs had been planted in the building, and they went off simultaneously with the impact of the plane. He's spot on. But he changed his tune two days later. And this man changed his tune 10 days later. He was reported again in, the, in this Albuquerque Journal saying, oh, it was just fires. The fires brought down the building. So the question is, what was this man doing in Washington, D.C. on 9-11? He was going to the Pentagon to discuss defense spending for his university. So when he changed his tune, the money started to roll in. It's all about money. And here we have the, the, the destruction of the Twin Towers. And as one of the men who was involved with the, removing the rubble said, all that was left of the World Trade Center was dust and steel. This is the dust. This is all of the stone, the, the concrete, the, the, uh, uh, the contents of, of uh, 110 floors in each tower, and everything on those floors, including about, uh, what was it, 2,600 human lives, turned into dust. What do they say on Ash Wednesday? From dust to dust. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And here we have the lower Manhattan with the collapse of one of the towers, you see. And what's, what's important to understand is that this, this dust was very hot. This is the dust from the de destruction of the towers. And it contained lots of molten iron, which was very hot. So it's very much like the pyroclastic flows that you see from Hawaii or Mount St. Helens. When, the, when a mountain explodes, it contains lava, molten lava. These contained molten iron. And here's the, 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 the strange building that Larry Silverstein also owned, the 47-story building, the Solomon Brothers building. It fell down at 5.20 in the afternoon, long after the other towers had fallen. At 5.20 in the afternoon, this building, which was a block away, just fell straight down into its footprint. It didn't do the exploding thing like the North Tower and South Tower. It just fell straight down. But you could see that, you know, squibs coming out the side of the building. You could see that it was a classic controlled demolition. The building fell straight down into its footprint. So it didn't affect the buildings next door, right, center. It went right into its own foundation. That's what they, that's what they do controlled demolition to do. Now, how do they do that? In the case of the World Trade Center, to get the buildings to fall, each tower had 47 core columns, which were large box columns. These are the box columns in the background here. At the base, the, the, steel, the steel in these box columns was four inches thick. And as the, as the column went higher, the thickness of those walls tapered down to the top. They were only a quarter inch thick. But these are like the dandelion stems. These are the stems that held up the tower. And in order for the tower to fall, all 47, to all 47 columns had to be cut simultaneously. How was that done? Using thermite. Here we see one of the columns has been cut at a 45 degree angle, cleanly at a straight 45 degree angle. What they did on that, in that case, they put a, they put a, a, a thermite cutter charge, wrapped it around the column, and when it, when it detonated, it cut that column like a, warm knife through like a warm knife through butter. And here we see this column here in the middle, it appears to have melted, melted steel on, on the side here, and it's been cut also at a 45 degree angle, but a little bit differently. That's, that seems to be evidence of, of cutter charges because every single column had to be cut at the same time or the buildings wouldn't fall. So then in 2005, I've been writing about this since 2001, and I've been living in Europe most of the time because I, I thought it was unsafe to be pointing out the lies of the government and the media when the government and media lies were being used to take us to war. I said, how safe can I be, be, be writing little articles from my my home in Schaumburg, Illinois, when the government's going to war on these lies. So we prudently moved to Europe for a few years. But when I came back, I came back in 2005, I was kind of snookered back, and I met with this man, Professor Stephen Jones, because he was, he was interested in the evidence of molten steel, molten iron found in the rubble of the World Trade Center. So we, comp we shared notes. I came out there in March of 2006 and met with him in Provo, Utah. And here is the kind of thermite reaction that we're talking about. This is a thermite reaction. 
This is a, a classic thermite reaction occurring on the 81st floor. This is about seven minutes before collapse of South Tower, east corner. This is the 80th floor. So it's like the 81st floor. Something's going on, breaking through the floor there, creating this white smoke and a very high temperature. And another product is molten metal. So we have a picture from exactly one minute later. We have a cascade. You can see a cascade of molten iron pouring off the building. This is coming from a window that's about two feet wide. And it's pouring off the building. White hot, yellow hot, molten iron. The official story can't account for this, so they, they, they lie. They said it was aluminum. They assumed that it's like the plane was melting. This wasn't aluminum, because molten aluminum looks like tin foil in, in daylight. Then underneath the, underneath the rubble piles, it, there were extremely hot, hot spots. They called them in the newspaper fires. And it wasn't until Christmas of 2001 that the fires, they said the fires were put out. They weren't fires. They were thermetic reactions. They were extremely hot reactions going on under the pile. They, and they don't need oxygen because they have their own oxygen in the, in, the, in the thermite. And you see that they would remove the rubble and they would find just underneath temperatures like a foundry and the steel was being melted. And the firefighters confirmed that. They said you'd get down below and you'd see molten steel running down the channel rails like you're in a foundry, like lava, like a volcano. And in 2002, I called Peter Tully. There were four contractors who removed the steel from the World Trade Center. Only one of them was American. One was British, two were British, one was a German, and, and Peter Tully from Tully Construction in Flushing. He was the only one who was willing to speak to me. And he said that when they got down to the bedrock of Manhattan, you know, six basement levels down, they got down to the bedrock of Manhattan, they found pools of literally molten steel at the base of the World Trade Center. Well, and the steel was still in the molten form. And here you see one of those pools, a large pool of molten, you know, yellow hot steel, yellow hot iron. And then the, those clouds I told you about, those pyroclastic clouds that rolled through Manhattan. They contain billions of tiny balls of molten iron, which were created during the demolition. Burning jet fuel cannot produce spheres of molten iron. It requires temperatures above 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. But superthermite super thermite does. These are microscopic, these are called micro, micrographs, because this is a photograph taken under a microscope. And this is what they found. These little balls, they're called iron-rich spheres. They're called iron-rich spheres because they're primarily iron, but they also contain some aluminum. And here you see a, like little tennis balls. And they also found molybdenum. This is, this is a ball of molybdenum, and that was found in the dust as well. And these, these drawings, or these, these micro, micrographs, come to us from the US Geological Survey of the Dust. They did the survey of the dust in um, 2000, it was printed in 2005. And I happened to be in, at UC Davis in California doing research. And I was lucky because it was one of two places in the state of California that had this document. It was very, very hard to get this document. And I photocopied the entire document and took it back with me to Provo, Utah to show Professor Jones. It was very, it was important that he see this material. Now, what would have made the molybdenum, the little tiny ball of molybdenum? Another form of thermite. This, this is the first form of thermite here, aluminum with molybdenum trioxide. And what this is from the Department of Defense, what this chart shows you, what this graph shows you, is that these top four bars represent aluminothermic reactions, thermites. These are thermites. And these down below here, these are high explosives like TNT. And what it shows you is the potential of aluminum. Metal oxidizers, thermites, have higher energy density than high explosives. Means for per cubic centimeter or per gram of explosive, you get more bang for your buck using thermite than you do using high explosives. But it says here, this third point, potential exists to increase kinetics by size reduction. What that means is that if you reduce the size of the aluminum and the iron oxide to almost like microscopic nanoparticle size, and you put those, those reactant particles side by side, you've increased immensely the power of the explosive and the speed at which it burns. It goes from being a, a normal burning thing to an explosive. It, it burns faster than the speed of sound. That's what they did with 9-11. That's what was used on 9-11. This is the material that was found in the dust. It looked like little chips of paint, 
But when they tested this, in, and they took these little chips of paint and heated them up to 430 degrees Celsius, they went bang and created a little tiny drop of, of, of iron and a little puff of white smoke and a great deal of heat. This is called super thermite. It's made using nanotechnology. Nano means very, very, very small. Smaller than one-tenth of a micron in diameter. A micron is a millionth of a meter. So here we see the material up close. This is a, it was a bi-layered material. It had, it had a red layer and a gray layer. Now, some people say it may have been applied like one coating and a second coating. And I think it may have been also a, a foil. It might have been a foil that was simply made with a, a shiny side and a red side and then applied. And there's some evidence that a foil like that was applied in Building 7 in the stairwells. And these, these, these fires were so hot under the World Trade Center. They were so hot that the iron in the, in, underneath the, at the ground level was boiling. It wasn't just melted, it was boiling. And so it was cooking off these tiny particles. It was vaporizing iron. And that iron was coming up in nanoparticles. It was nanoparticles. So the firefighters who walked on the pile, like these men here, were inhaling. They were inhaling these toxic particles because nanoparticles are so small that they're very toxic because they, they don't stop in your lungs or, your, or the tissues of your throat or your nose. They're so small that they permeate every tissue, every membrane in your body until they get to the nucleus of the human cell. And they lodge themselves in the nucleus of the human cell and that's where they cause cancer. And so 1,600 of these firefighters have died of cancer already. And that figure is a couple months old already. And there were 5,700 more in New York who are dying of cancer. So you see in New York with the firefighters, they have a huge public health concern. And Mayor Bloomberg has basically been suppressing that. He's been suppressing the, the, the uh, knowledge of the suffering police and firefighters in New York and other people who inhaled this. Now, there's, there's a case for legal action against the former EPA administrator, her name was Christy Todd Whitman, who said to the people of New York and the nation, the air is safe to breathe. The air was anything but safe to breathe. If you lived in that part of Manhattan, it would have been a good time to go to the Caribbean for a few months and come back after the fires went out because for three months, this, this, these fumes from this smoke, this is the smoke, not the dust, was very toxic. As, K, as Professor Kehlu analyzed the smoke, who found the nanoparticles, said it was like they were working inside the stack of an incinerator. And I asked him, when I was at Davis, I said, Professor Cahill, what would explain the presence of nanoparticles in the smoke? And he said, only temperatures hotter than the boiling point of the metal involved. So I wrote an article, why did iron boil in the rubble of the World Trade Center? The next day I got a call from my editor in Washington, D.C. I wrote for a little alternative newspaper out there, and he said, your travel allowance has been reduced to zero. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Which meant I had to go back to Chicago, where I knew I was being surveilled by the FBI. Within about 10 days of my return from out west to, to my hometown in Chicago, I was attacked by an undercover tactical unit led by a man who worked for Homeland Security. And that was when they criminalized me. And they did the exact same thing, not exactly the same thing, but they, they attacked Professor Jones at a few weeks after I was attacked out in Utah. They got him on public radio. They asked, they asked him several times, who's behind 9-11? Who's behind 9-11? And finally, he said, I'm a scientist, but he said, I've read some things by somebody named Tarpley, and I've heard that it has to do with the international banking cartel who seeks to get control of Middle Eastern countries that does, they do not control. Then they said, okay, thank you, Professor Jones. They, they hung up the phone on him. Then the first caller was the head of the Jewish Federation in Utah. Tempowski, I think his name is. And Mr. Tempowski says, when Professor Jones says um, international banking cartel, he's speaking in code. What he means is the Jews. And it's anti-Semitic for him to say things like that. The next day, he was suspended from teaching at BYU, a Mormon-owned school, where I thought he was safe. But apparently, there are powers above the bishops of the Mormon church. And so this is the blue smoke that rose. As I said, it contained huge amounts of nanoparticles. You can tell by the bluish color of the smoke, this kind of sick bluish color that you used to see out of car exhaust is indicative of, of nanoparticles in the smoke. And this smoke, this was smoking until Christmas of 2001. That's how long the fires went on. So the people who worked on this pile, they would have to change shoes like a half a dozen times because the soles of their shoes were melting. 
So the government and the media, they don't tell us anything about this evidence. This is basic forensic evidence from 9-11. They don't talk about it. The media primarily doesn't talk about it at all. Which means if the government and media are lying to us about 9-11, it means they are controlled by the same people who carried out 9-11. That is our political predicament in a nutshell. And it's very serious. It stands to reason that the only people who are being protected by the cover-up are the guilty. So if the government and media are controlled by people who carried out 9-11, we are in dire straits in this country. If they're not telling us the truth about 9-11, what are they telling us the truth about? Nothing. That's it. So how does it work in a country like this? Well, in the last few years, the, the consolidation of the media, which was done under Michael Powell, Colin Powell's son, he was head of the FCC, he allowed this consolidation process to begin in the media. And, and so that we have now 95% of the media outlets in this country, newspapers, television channels, radio networks, are owned by only six companies. And those, so that's a consolidation of media that is very unhealthy in a so-called democratic country. We don't have a free press anymore. We have a corporate controlled press that is all singing in unison. They're, they sing in, they're pro-war, they're pro-Israel, they're, they don't say anything about the chemtrails. They, they, there's a lot of things they don't talk about and the things they do talk about, we really don't need to hear about. But how does it work? Well, media moguls are created. Like this man, Rupert Murdoch, came from Australia, to, came to the United States in 1980s, like 1980, about 1985. And he started buying up media properties like the Chicago Sun-Times, left and right, until he owned 160 newspapers in this country in 2003. He owns more now because he took over the Wall Street Journal and a bunch of other papers. Well, media moguls like Mr. Murdoch are created by banksters like the Rothschilds. That's Mr. Rothschild, Jacob Rothschild on the right here. That's Rupert Murdoch. And media moguls like Rupert Murdoch, who pushed the lies about 9-11 and the war on terror, are complicit with the terrorists who bombed the Twin Towers. And the banksters, like the Rothschilds, create media moguls for one reason, to control public opinion. If everything you read or see or hear on the radio or the TV or the newspaper tells you that, yes, we need to go to war with Iraq in 2003, you'll, most of you will probably say, yeah, I think we do need to go to war with Iraq. And that's exactly what Murdoch's papers told you. All 160 newspapers said the same thing. So Americans came away thinking, yeah, we don't really want to do it, but we have to do it. And off to war we went. And the, one of the points is that these two men these two fellas own the oil in the Golan Heights, in the occupied Golan Heights, Israeli occupied territory. They own the oil company, along with this handsome fellow over here, Dick Cheney. And this man down here, this is the Israeli head of the their Israeli branch called Genie, Genie Energy. It's an oil company on the Golan Heights. This man is a rabid rabbi. He's very anti-Arab. He has said before, we will have to kill them all, referring to the Palestinians and the Arabs. Now, the weekend after 9-11, George Bush came back from a weekend at Camp David. He was on the White House lawn, and he, he was speaking about 9-11. He wasn't quite so confident yet, and he said, this crusade, this war on terrorism is going to take a while. Now, ask yourself, why would it take a while if we're just going to go after some Islamic terrorists that are in Afghanistan hiding in caves. Why should that take more than a couple of months? Afghanistan was and is, after all, the poorest country in Asia. They don't even have an air force. They don't have a navy. They don't have, they don't have an army. Why should it take you know, more than a few weeks to, to round up these guys? Because he was preparing the nation for a long, open-ended war across the Middle East, which we are now in for the 16th year, now in the 17th year. Preparing the public. He said the war on terror began officially in his rhetoric on September 20th when he said every nation in every region has a decision to make. Either you're with us or you're with the terrorists. So he bifurcated the world between friendly countries and terrorist countries. And nobody wanted to be on that side. So they all joined in. They said, okay, Switzerland said, we'll send a couple doctors there. And Sweden said, we'll send a, guy, a couple guys over there. Every country contributed a little bit. So like the current, the current Operation Inherent Resolve against ISIS has 68 nations in it. 
68 nations fighting ISIS in Raqqa, and it takes eight months to liberate the city. It, take, it took eight months to destroy the city and ethnically cleanse it of its Arab population. There was a situation a few months ago that the Kurds abused an Arabic man badly. The Arabs dress differently, they look differently, they wear different clothes. And they beat this man up, and he was all bloody, he was a grandfather, and they said, they said to him, why didn't you leave? Because the essence of the crime, what's going on in Iraq and, and Mosul, is that they want the Kurds to take these cities and to expel, ethnically cleanse, the Arab population. So the cost of the war on terror has cost, at least at this point, the wars alone, 1.7 trillion, homeland security, another 700 billion. So it's at the most conservative estimate, most conservative, two and a half trillion dollars borrowed money. But what is the war on terror? Why are we spending that kind of money on this nebulous war fighting phantoms? The war on terror is a fraud, as these people say in San Francisco, 911truth.org, because the fraudulent war on terror is based on the official lies, the myth of 9-11. And in order to pr pr protect the myth, they don't report any of the facts about 9-11. And the, the, our whole media can never redeem itself for what they've done. They've lied to us for 16 years. How can they ever apologize. Oh, we're sorry. We just didn't know. We didn't know about Mr. Bolin's research. We didn't know about that molten iron. They knew about that molten iron. They're intentionally keeping us in the dark so to keep the war agenda going forward. It's that simple. This is just to give you an idea of how much money we're spending per victim of terrorism in this country. We are spending $400 million per year per victim of terrorism in this country. Compare that with cancer and influenza and heart disease. And this stack would have to be a thousand times higher than it is to be in scale. This is a criminal fraud. How do we end? This is a massive scam. This is taking the food off our tables and the money out of our communities all across this country. And I come back every, every now and then from Sweden, and I'm always shocked at how, how far this country has fallen. I live in, a, in, in Sweden. It's not a rich country. But everybody has medical treatment. Everybody has a house to live in. There's no homelessness. There's no people that go without going to the doctor or the dentist. And it's like, this can all be done in this country. But they don't want us to have this. All our money goes to war. But where did the war on terror come from? The war on terror is an Israeli stratagem, a device to trick us. It's a plot pushed by Netanyahu since 1979 to trick the United States into waging war against Israel's enemies. The war on terror. I'm going to talk a little bit about how this evolved. And this is going to involve a little bit of Israeli history and a little bit of Zionist history. Zionism is primarily the uh, national, the idea that, 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 that Jews should have a national state to themselves. That's in a nutshell what it means. It's a political ideology, not religious not racial, political. This is how it all started. This is called the Balfour Declaration, and this is the birth certificate of the State of Israel. It was written 100 years ago, November 2nd, 1917. It was written by Lord Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary. It was written as a personal letter to Lord Rothschild, the man standing over there on the side here. That's Lord Rothschild. 1900. And he says, Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which have been submitted and approved by the cabinet. So this was when the British said, we support the idea of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And this is because after World War I, the British became the mandate power of Palestine. And they gave, to, they gave that land that they were, they were mandate power, they gave it to the Jews. They gave part of it to the Jews. This was, how, this was where the whole Palestinian problem started. And then 30 years later, the United Nations partitioned. They made a partition plan. In 1947, partition was all the vogue. They partitioned, they partitioned India and Pakistan. They partitioned Palestine. And they gave the blue sections here to the Jewish population and the orange sections to the Palestinians. But it was intrinsically unfair. They gave the better land and more land to the Jews, who were the minority population, and gave the majority Palestinians less land and inferior land. 
So it led to a war. It led to a civil war. The day after the partition plan was voted, was passed in the United Nations, Menachem Begin spoke about this, and he said he's a, a maximalist. He, he believes in the greater Israel, this, this whole blue section. And he said the partition of Palestine is illegal. Jerusalem was and will forever be our capital. And Eretz Israel will be restored to the people of Israel, all of it and forever. When we say Eretz Israel, that's Hebrew for land of Israel. And it's in, we often call it greater Israel. It's, the, it's this maximalist expansion of Israel between the river Euphrates and the Nile. And right now, in Syria, just today, the Kurds have said that they will take this entire section from the Euphrates River here, this entire eastern section, this yellow section, will be Kurdistan in Syria. And this is meeting with great resistance from the government of Syria as well. They're trying to partition Syria as they're partitioning Iraq. That's the plan. That's what they're doing. Now, in 1976 and 77 and 78, Benjamin Netanyahu, who worked here in Boston for a company called Boston Consulting Group, which is a Rothschild-owned company. In 1979, he went back to Israel, and with his father here, Ben Zion Milikovsky, born in Warsaw, Poland, they started something called the Netanyahu Institute. And the first event they had was an international conference, a con international conference on terrorism in Jerusalem in July. And George Herbert Walker Bush spoke at that conference when he was running for president. He was running for president at the time. And after that, Netanyahu made a career out of promoting the idea, the doctrine of the war on terror, basically saying it like this, that the United States should bring its military and the militaries of the Western democracies into the Middle East to wage war against Israel's enemies. The reason he said this, there's a little sleight of hand here, is that he said the Islamic radical terrorists only attack Israel for one reason. You know what that reason is? because it's a Western state and has Western values. That's why they attack it. And because it's out there sticking out in the Middle East, they attack it because they don't like Western values. They don't like our freedoms. It's nothing to do with Palestinians. No, nothing to do with Palestinians. And, and then he says that the real target is the West. So therefore it's incumbent on the West to come to, to fight the bad guys on behalf of the West. And that's, that's the, it's, they can, he conflates Israel with the West. And so he's made these, he's written these books from other conferences like terrorism, how the West can win, and fighting terrorism. So the whole idea is that this is the doctrine, the Israeli doctrine of the war on terror, which is what we are now in. And this was all done under the prime, prime minister of, at the time, Menachem Begin, this man. He was the one who organized the whole conference. Now, you have to remember, the man who's giving the conference on international terrorism, who organized it, is the master terrorist of Israel from the 1940s. This is the man who blew up the King David Hotel, for example. This is the man who massacred the people of Deir Yassin. So he said, this is the father of terrorism. He was interviewed when, his, when, he, when he created this Likud party in 1973. He was interviewed by a British journalist who says, Mr. Begin, how does it feel in light of all that's going on to be the father of terrorism in the Middle East? And Begin said, in the Middle East, in all the world, putting on himself this mantle of being the father of terrorism in the Middle East. This is not me saying this about him. These are his own words. This is how he defines himself. And the man here smiling is um, Bibi, uh, Bibi Netanyahu. He's been the head of the Likud party since 1993. Here's Menachem Begin in 1948. He was born in Russia in 1913, came to Palestine in 42, became the leader of the Irgun, the terrorist army, in 44 bombed the King David Hotel in 1946, committed the Deir Yassin Massacre in 1948, created the Likud party of his former terrorist buddies in, in 73, and became prime minister in 77. And that's the time I was living in Israel. And I had an Israeli girlfriend who was a labor kibbutznik, and she was very sad that day, and she said, this is the day that Israel died. She said, the terrorists have taken power. And then he promptly invaded Lebanon. I lived in Israel in the late 70s, 77, 78. Here's what he did in 1946. This is the handiwork of Menachem Begin. He blew up the King David Hotel. It was the worst act of Palestinian Israeli, Israeli terrorism, Palestinian terrorism ever. 93 people were killed, and it was done with the Haganah and Irgun, and he was the mastermind. And they killed 14 British officers because this was British military headquarters. 
it was it's the fancy it's, it's they rebuilt that part it's the it's the fanciest hotel in Jerusalem King David Hotel and it's the the the, the bombing of the King David Hotel is very very similar to 911 in the, in the respect that both bombings were done to destroy evidence now when Begin became uh, you know, when, when he was doing this stuff in Palestine in the late 40s and Israel became a state, he came, Begin came to visit this country in New York in 1948 in December. And this prompted Albert, Albert Einstein to write a letter to the New York Times in protest of this terrorist coming to America. And this, it, it, Einstein's letter was signed by 26 prominent Jews. And the letter read, read like this, this important part here, he says, he said that the discrepancies between the bold claims being made by Begin and his party and their record of past per performance in Palestine bear the imprint of no ordinary political party. This is the unmistakable stamp of a fascist party for whom terrorism and misrepresentation, read deception, are means and a leader state is the goal. In the light of the foregoing considerations, it is imperative that the truth about Mr. Begin and his movement be made known in this country. United States. It is all the more tragic that the top leadership of American Zionism has refused to campaign against Begin's efforts or even to expose to its own constituents the dangers to Israel from support to Begin. Unfortunately, the warning of, of Albert Einstein went unheeded. He went on to say the public avowals of Begin's party are no guide whatever to its actual character. Today they speak of freedom, democracy, and anti-imperialism, whereas until recently they openly preached the doctrine of the fascist state. It is in its actions that the terrorist party betrays its real character. From its past actions, we can judge what it may be expected to do in the future. This is what the party did in 1946 in Jerusalem. 9-11 is what they did in the United States in 2001. The Irgun was Menachem Begin's militia, for, and, and this militia came out of a movement called the New Zionist Organization, based in New York City, headed by a man named Vladimir Jabotinsky. And Jabotinsky was an extremist Zionist. He said, for example, that they, that they should have to build an iron wall. In 1922, he wrote an essay called The Iron Wall, and he said they would have to build an iron wall separating the Jews from the non-Jews, the Palestinians, in Palestine. That wall is the wall that Ariel Sharon built in 2003. That is the wall. Twice the height of the Berlin Wall and 40 times longer across the Holy Land. Well, what's interesting is that when J Vladimir Jabotinsky died in New York City in 1940, the NZO, the Zion New Zionist Organization, was taken over by his executive secretary, who was Benzion Milakovsky Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu's father. So Bibi Netanyahu has grown up inculcated with these beliefs of the greater Israel, of the use of weapons, of the use of terrorism. <clears throat> you can see that he's, although he speaks English very well, his behavior in front of in, in the United States Congress or in front of the United Nations Assembly, he's psychopathic. He's psychopathic in his, in his presentation. Here's Menachem Begin when he came to power in 1977. And you could tell by his looks that he was not a very nice guy. Here he is with two of his colleagues, main colleagues. Here's Begin in the middle. This is Yitzhak Shamir over here. This is Ariel Sharon. All well-known terrorists with long histories of terrorism and genocide. For example, Yitzhak Shamir, this guy down here, was the, was the thug who ran a group called Lehi, or the Stern Gang. And the Stern Gang was the gang that killed the UN envoy of Palestine this Swedish count named Volker Bernadotte in September 1948. This man was sent to Palestine by the United Nations to try and make a, 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 a way of solution to the partition plan. And part of this, any solution he said would have to involve Jerusalem remaining an open city for all. That was anathema, anathema to the Zionist leaders. So they killed him. They intercepted his car outside Kalandi Airport by Jerusalem, put a machine gun in the back window, and machine gunned him to death with, along with a French colonel. Well, in this gang, in Shamir's gang, Shamir was the head of that gang. In that gang was this man's father. You recognize this guy? 
the mayor of Chicago, sweet home Chicago, my hometown. This is Rami Manuel. He's the son of a terrorist. I spoke to his father. His father is Benjamin Manuel, formerly Auerbach. And this man, Rahm Emanuel, has been the Mossad man in the White House for a long time, for decades. He was senior advisor to Bill Clinton, and he's the man who pushed NAFTA through in 1993, single-handedly, he takes credit for that, and he was Barack Obama's first choice as chief of staff. Now, false flag terrorism is not new, especially for the Israelis. They've been doing it a long time. The first known episode of false flag terrorism was something called the Lavon Affair in Egypt in 19... 54. And what happened is that these three men were the masterminds of that. This is Shimon Perez, a little bit pudgy at that time. This is Pinhas Lavon, and this is Moshe Dayan. This is photograph taken August 19, 1954. Just one month earlier, they'd been busted. They had been, they, their, their Egyptian Jewish sleeper cell had been caught with nitroglycerin bombs. They had been putting bombs in American libraries and American cultural institutions in Egypt. And who was being blamed? The Muslim Brotherhood. Because what they wanted to do is they, the Israelis wanted to put a wedge between Nasser, Egypt, and the West, between the United States and, and Nasser, and between Britain. So they were bombing British and American cultural institutions. But they were caught. And when they were caught, their Egyptian agents fessed up and said everything. And the whole plot was revealed. That's when Mossad learned that in the future, they would always compartmentalize the op their, their operations so that nobody knew more than he needed to know. So if you caught one guy, he wouldn't expose the whole, the whole conspiracy. Here you see, these guys, one month after they've been busted, they're smiling. They're smiling. They're happy. They're, they're, not, they're not ashamed. They had done this without the knowledge of the prime minister at the time. The prime minister at the time was a man named Moshe Sherit. He was the last dove prime minister Israel ever had. And he writes a long diary about how the terrorists succeeded in overwhelming his, his dove party back then. And he said that Perez shares the same ideology as Pinhas Lavon. He wants to frighten the West into supporting Israel's aims. And that's exactly where we are today. We are frightened of the terrorism. We're frightened of the terror. We're frightened. We're frightened to the point where we will accept whatever the government tells us. So when they do the shootings down there in Las Vegas, more security, more backscatter machines. Every casino will have a, well, you'll have to walk through a machine to, you know, like you do at the airport now. They're, they're trying to turn this nation into a nation of cattle that we have to walk through scanners every day like you do in Israel or some places in, 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 in England because they want to frighten the West into supporting Israel's aims. Fear is the main tool in the war on terror and you all are the target, the American population. They want us to be in great fear. So every now and then they have to throw a new log on the fire a new attack, a new terrorist attack, a new car driving down the promenade, a new shooting. Well, the, the Zionist state of Israel, the American Joint Chiefs of Staff knew would be a, a threat to the United States. They knew it would be a problem. And they did 13 papers that were written before Israel became a state in 1948. And from the 13th paper they wrote, they, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, highest level brass in the American government, they said Zionist strategy, will seek to involve the United States in a continuously widening and deepening series of operations intended to secure maximum Jewish objectives. What were those Jewish objectives they wanted? They said, the expansion of Eretz Israel, Israel into the Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, and two, the establishment of Jewish military and economic hegemony over the entire Middle East. This is the policy that is underlying the war on terror. This is what we're doing now. And as you can see by this drawing by David Dees, this illustration, he shows Libya, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Roadkill on the side of the road. Libya today, Libya was the most advanced country in North Africa. It had the highest standard of living in all of Africa. I think even more than South Africa. It was extremely advanced under Muammar Gaddafi. Today it is broken up, it's a chaotic country with no central command, and the oil is being plundered from the state. There are special teams that protect the oil fields. So the oil keeps flowing to Italy and to Europe, but the, the people of, of Libya have no government anymore. It's chaos. Afghanistan, Iraq, and here in the middle of the, in the, in the, in the, the Zionism, international Zionism has in its crystal ball, Syria. It was no 
secret that Israel wanted to attack these countries already in 1948. Here's the first prime minister of Israel. His name is David Ben-Gurion. He was a Rothschild employee. He, was the, he, he worked in the vineyards of Rishon Letzion, the first settlement in, Palestine, in Zion built by the Rothschilds, owned by the Rothschilds. They, the, the Rothschilds built the first 30 settlements in Palestine, the first 30 Zionist settlements in Palestine. They also paid for the Knesset and the Supreme Court and everything else. But here is, is David Ben-Gurion speaking to his general staff about a week after Israel became a state in May of 1948. He said, we should prepare to go over to the offensive with the aim of smashing Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. So you can see that Israel had a very aggressive position policy from the very beginning. And then this is a, a very important Israeli terrorist operation that was done in 1967 when they attacked, it was a false flag attack, they attacked an American vessel called the USS Liberty off the coast of Egypt. This was a spy ship, an American spy ship, US Navy, and it was brutally attacked by the Israeli forces on June, June 8th, 1967. Un, unlike this illustration here, the Israeli planes were not marked with the Rothschild star, the Star of David, but they mercilessly attacked the ship and we now know from the transcripts between the pilots and ground control, the ground control asked the pilots, identify the ship. The pilots radioed back, it's American, it's American. The orders came back from ground control, sink the ship, no survivors. And that's what they tried to do. It's only by the grace of God the ship didn't sink. They killed 34 Americans in one fell swoop. Those guys that got hit by a torpedo down below decks, they were the guys wearing the headphones that were uh, the radio guys, the, the communication experts. It was an NSA ship, after all. Now, here's Hillary Clinton speaking in, in an email in 2012 when she was Secretary of State. She was, uh, this is leaked by WikiLeaks. She wrote, the best way to help Israel is to use force in Syria to overthrow the government. Now, there was no American interest in overthrowing the government of Syria, but she says it's the best way to help Israel. So we spent, under Obama, $1 billion, $1 billion a year for those mercenaries to attack the government of Syria. Again, there's no American interest at all in that. There, why should America overthrow the government of Syria? And here it's very interesting to note that Hillary, sim, Hillary Clinton's symbol was, looks like the Twin Towers with a, plane going, with a plane going through the towers. Looks like that, doesn't it? And so 22 years after it was born in Jerusalem, the Israeli war on terror became operational. The purpose of 9-11, the purpose of 9-11 was to start the war. That's, you have to understand it. It's not like 9-11 like, um, happened and then the war on terror fell out of the sky. It's the other way around. The war on terror was constructed in the decades before 9-11, and the keystone was 9-11. And that when you drop that keystone in place, the whole war on terror plot became operational. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the most conspicuous Israeli connections to 9-11. First of all, the lead agent, Arnon Milchan, made a movie, his very first movie, he's a Hollywood mo movie guy, besides being a nuclear smuggling agent. His first movie was um, called The Medusa Touch, in which a Boeing 747 crashed into the Pan Am building in New York. And the same year he made this film, 1978, here he is talking with the chief, Israeli chief of defense, Ezra Weitzman. So you can see that this man has very high level connections to the military defense, military intelligence, He's been an Israeli um, agent from his youth. He's making a movie. He's, he's obsessed with this idea of planes flying into buildings. This is the prop that they, that they made the film. It was made in England and France. Here he is more recently. Um, he's the producer of movies like JFK and Pretty Woman. He also made a movie called Brazil, which is a very, it's a futuristic film which shows our reality today. Terrorism happens all the time. The nation is fighting a far off, far flung war against terrorists. <clears throat> and here he is between Shimon Peres and the current Prime Minister of Israel, Bibi Netanyahu. This man, Milkan, was also involved in smuggling nuclear triggers to Israel, 850 nuclear triggers in the 1980s, with this fella, Netanyahu. And what's interesting is that just recently, under, under John Kerry, the Secretary of State, this man was given a long-term visa to the United States of America, although he's known to have been a nuclear smuggler. That, that doesn't bother anybody. So that when they talk about they're, they're obsessed with nuclear weapons in, in, uh, in North Korea or Iran, 
That's all a show. They don't care if, as long as nuclear weapons are in the right hands, they think. And then they made a movie. His business partner, Murdoch, made a film in which a Boeing, a Boeing aircraft is hijacked remotely and flown into the World Trade Center. And they made this movie in 2000. And it, it aired on TV, on Fox TV, six months before 9-11 happened. And it showed a, an, a passenger aircraft being remotely hijacked and flown into the World Trade Center. And here we have the father of Israeli intelligence, Isser Harel. He's the man who started the Mossad. He was the first chief of the Mossad, first chief of the Shin Bet. In, in, in 1979, he predicted that Arabs would attack the World Trade Center. And I point out that the Mossad, their, their, their emblem here and their motto is, by deception, thou shalt make war. By deception. Because deception is the tool of that, that, that that you can use to control huge amounts of people. If you deceive, America is a deceived nation right now. It's that simple. And when you have the nation deceived, you don't have to do anything. Just keep them deceived. When they're deceived, they will, they will do the wrong thing. They will work against their interests. They will send their children to wars they shouldn't send. They will give the money that they shouldn't give because they're deceived. And unfortunately, this nation is woefully deceived. Here's the man who made the prediction, too. This is a, a, a Jewish TV evangelist called Michael Evans. Here he is with Menachem Begin in 1979. And Isra Harrell predicted to him that Arab terrorists would attack the tallest buildings in New York City 22 years before it happened. The prediction went like this. This is what Mr. Evans said. He asked Mr. Harrell, do you think terrorism will come to America? And if so, where and why? Harrell said, I fear it will come to you in America. America has the power but not the will to fight terrorism. The terrorists have the will, but not the power to fight America. But all that could change with time. Arab oil money buys more than tents. As to the where, Harrell continued, New York City is the symbol of freedom and capitalism. It's likely they will strike the Empire State Building, your tallest building and a symbol of your power. He said that in 1979. This is the head of Israeli intelligence. Now, what he then did is the, following, the head of Israeli intelligence sent two of his leading men, old guys, to America to get the contract for the World Trade Center. And they got it in 1987. The head of the company called Atwell Security Tel Aviv was this man, Avraham Shalom, or Avraham Shalom Bendor. He uses a couple of last names, they're all fake. He was the head of the Shin Bet. And in 1984, he was involved in an in a, in a operation where some Palestinians were caught having hijacked a bus, and the, and the Shin Bet agents called from the field. They said, what do we do with these Palestinians? We got these two guys. He said, smash their heads with rocks. So that's what they did, and it led to a court process in Israel, and he was relieved of his position in 1986, and he came to America then. He came to America to get this, the contract for the World Trade Center, security contract, and they got it in 1987. But somebody at the Port Authority discovered that this man was using one of the fake names, he, he was actually convicted in Israel of this murder. And, and, he, and the person at the Port Authority said, we should tear up the contract. And they did. It's a good thing. Had they not torn up the contract, 9-11 probably would have happened in the 1980s or early 1990s. And we would have been at a big disadvantage because we, we didn't have any internet then. So here's Shalom Ben-Dor. This is the guy that was smashing rocks with Palestinian heads with rocks. And this is Zvi Malkin. And these two men were the top lieutenants under Isser Harel in the Mossad. They were the guys that went to Argentina and kidnapped Adolf Eichmann and took him to trial in Jerusalem. These are the guys who smuggled plutonium from Pennsylvania to Israel for nuclear weapons. So these are not small fry. These were very high level guys. And you can see they're like in their 60s or 70s when they come to America to get this contract for the World Trade Center. Well, they didn't quit. They didn't give it up. They didn't say, oh, you know, the Port Authority tore up the contract. We're going home to Tel Aviv. No, they went to work for this guy, Jules Kroll, business partner with, with, with Maurice Greenberg down here. Now, Maurice Greenberg, you might recall, is the man who was the CEO of AIG. AIG is the company that got a $180 billion bailout in 2008, 2009. Half it was done by Bush. Half was done by Obama. Remember that? This was the company that was too big, too, too big to fail was also too criminal to succeed. This company, in one, in one board meeting, somebody, he had proposed to, uh, he or somebody had proposed that they should find how much it would cost 
for AIG to be legal. And he said to the board meeting, he said, if we were legal, we wouldn't be in business. And this is the company that insured Bank of America and Goldman Sachs. And so when, when they bailed out, we bailed out the banks in 2008, we gave the money to his company and his company then gave the money to Goldman Sachs and Bank of America. So we bailed out the banks through him, through AIG. Well, those two Israeli guys I told you about were now working for him, Kroll Associates, Kroll, Jules Kroll. And Jules Kroll's company, Kroll Associates, got the security contract for the World Trade Center in 1993 after the bombing in the, in the garage, remember? 1993, February. And then the, the Port Authority said, we have to rewrite, we have to get new security here. They hired Kroll Associates. And at that time, Avram Shalom Bendor was working for Kroll. So they got in using this Trojan horse mechanism. Using a Trojan horse, they got in. Then, if you're going to have a war on terror, you got you to gotta have a good enemy. You got to make the enemy. Because the, the Muslim world is not full of people who are trying to attack the West. It's simply not the case. So if you're going to have a, a good villain, a good foe, you have to make it. So the CIA and Israeli intelligence created that foe. And that foe was called the Gang of Gulbadin in this, in this photograph here from Afghanistan. This is a current photograph of Afghan people protesting the Gang of Gulbadin. This is Gulbadin Hekmatyar. And the way it worked is that Israeli military intelligence under Ehud Barak armed and trained this gang of anti-Western terrorists in Pakistan during the 1980s. This is how it worked. Ehud Barak was the head of Israeli military intelligence, Aman, A-M-A-N. And in 1983 to 1985, they began training these, uh, this uh, Gulbadin Hekmatyar's faction. It's called Hezb Islami, which is Persian means party of Islam. And in, into, that jihad, into that jihad struggle came these guys from Arabia, like the CIA asset, um, Tim Osman or Osama bin Laden, this man here. And Osama bin Laden is the most famous of the Afghan Arabs who joined the jihad in Pakistan. In 1984, with Israeli trainers, Gulbadin developed close ties with Osama bin Laden. They started working together in 1984. And it, how, it, how it happened, it was with this man, Charlie Wilson, a congressman from Texas, very pro-Zionist. He basically worked with the Mossad to arrange for Israeli weapons from, from Lebanon and trainers to go to Pakistan to train the Mujahideen led by Gulbadin Hakmatyar, Hekmatyar. And they trained them in terrorism, how to make cars explode, how to make bicycles explode, how to make bombs. So the CIA was funding Israeli weapons and trainers for this group in Pakistan. But there's a question here. Why would the CIA and Israeli military intelligence arm and train the most anti-Western group out there? They were strongly anti-Western. And furthermore, they couldn't fight the Red Army to save their lives. They never won a battle against Russia in the whole time. And they were always stirring it up with the other gangs, other groups, other organizations. But they were, they were virulently anti-Western. Why would we support, why would we give the lion's share of money to an anti-Western group? Because they were creating the enemy for the next war. They were creating the boogeyman. They were creating that group of people, Al-Qaeda. They created Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was just the list of people that they trained. That's all it was. It was a database. That's what it means. Here's the Mossad connection. You knew it had to be there someplace, right? Here is the Charlie Wilson, the congressman from Texas. And, and Zvi Rafia, the Mossad station chief down here, had been Charlie Wilson's handler. And this Israeli agent used Wilson's congressional office as if it were his own. If you read the book, Charlie Wilson's War, you'll find this, this bit. It's not in the movie, of course, N never in the movie. In the book, it says, Rafia always acted as if he owned Wilson's office. One of his staffers kept a list of people he needed to lobby. He would use the phones, give projects to the staff, and call on Charlie to intervene whenever he needed him. So a congressional office was being used by the head of Israeli intelligence in Washington. And here's the man, Ali Mohammed, who was the first trainer of Osama bin Laden. He happens to be, he's supposedly Egyptian, but he happens to be a, a Hebrew speaking double agent. And I can tell you, you do not learn Hebrew in Egypt. I've been in Egypt and I've lived in Israel. The only place you learn is Hebrew is from Israelis. You know, that's the only way you learn it. So he was working with 
Israeli intelligence training Osama bin Laden in the early 1980s. He did more than that. This guy, all of those things that were done in the 1990s by, by Al-Qaeda, this guy was the mastermind. Here he is, here's, here's when he set up the, these are the guys that were involved in the, in the shooting of Rabi Kahana. And he was, he was essential in setting up the gang that bombed the World Trade Center in 1993. He, he's the guy who set up the cell in Nairobi that blew up the two American embassies in, in Africa. So when he was finally caught by the Americans, he was trained in this country after all. He was trained at Fort Bragg and, and Fort Hukachuka down there in Arizona where they trained army intelligence. So when he was finally caught and, and they pinned the blame for bombing the, world, the, bombing the uh, African embassies, two embassies in Africa, he was put in a federal penitentiary in this country from which he disappeared without a trace, never to be seen again. But the people that he trained, the group that he trained, became Al-Qaeda in 1994 and Taliban. The Pashtun, the Afghans who spoke Pashtun, became Taliban, and Al-Qaeda was the Arabic-speaking Arabs. They became Al-Qaeda in 1994. And then in 1993, we had the bombing of the World Trade Center, the first bombing. Now that bombing was done not to bring down the World Trade Center. That was, the bombing was done with the FBI, with the help of the FBI making the bomb. That bombing was prosecuted by Michael Sheratoff, who was the uh, attorney for the District of New Jersey. And, and Michael Mukasey oversaw the case in which they blamed the blind cleric. Now the way it worked, it was, a, it was a classic sting operation. There was a bomb went off, FBI made the bomb, six people were killed, the buildings didn't fall anywhere. It made a big hole in the, in the underground garage, but no way you could bring down a building with that kind of bomb. They knew that. The purpose of that bomb was to impress on the minds of the American people that Arabs are trying to bring down the World Trade Center. So they made movies to this effect where they, they, have the, they have the Arab bad guy in the back of a car in handcuffs and they're driving past the World Trade Center in the final scene of the movie and he looks up and he looks at the World Trade Center and he says, next time we'll bring them both down. So that's to impress on your mind that Arabs, Muslims are trying to bring down the World Trade Center. This is how they did it. FBI operation, you have an informant. The informant was this Egyptian guy here, Colonel Ahmed, Ahmad Salem. He was paid $1 million for his testimony against the blind cleric here, the blind cleric who was blamed for, nine, who was blamed for the bombing and sent to jail for like 5,000 years. So after, after Ahmad Salem was paid a million dollars for his testimony, he went in something called the Witness Protection Program and disappeared to San Diego with a face job. Something like that. Never to be, you know, new identity, lots of money. Then 9-11 was predicted and called for by Zionist think tanks. Here, for example, this is a, written by Philip Zelikow. It's a catastrophic terrorism study group report published in the CFR magazine Foreign Affairs, December 1998, in which Ashton Carter, John Deutsch, and Philip Zelikow are the main authors. And in this document, they were imagining the transforming event that would change America, change America forever. And they said, this has now moved from a far-fetched horror to a contingency that could happen next month. And the two of the authors, Philip Zelikow is the guy who wrote the World Trade Center Commission Report. Ashton Carter became Secretary of Defense under Barack Obama. And this is the Belgian-born um, John Deutsch, who was the uh, head of the CIA. At the time they wrote that document, they were working for a company called Global Technology Partners, an exclusive affiliate of Rothschild North America, formed to make acquisitions of and investments in technology, defense, and aerospace-related companies. You wonder where all that $2.5 trillion went, huh? The banksters create the money out of thin air, give it to the government, charge interest, and the money goes right back to the bankers. It goes back to the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds are very big consumers of that defense gravy train. Another group that called for a, a new Pearl Harbor was this project for the new American century. This was the creation of, of William Crystal and Robert Kagan in 1997. Here's Robert Kagan here. His wife is Victoria Nuland. You might recall Victoria Nuland is the lady who brought us the war in Ukraine. She's the person who oversaw the coup in Ukraine, 
where they replaced the government of Ukraine with an anti-Russian government designed to cause friction with Russia. That's why we have practically, it's like taking Texas out of the United States. It's just very similar. Well, this is the Kagan family, the Kagan family, and they, they produced a document called Rebuilding America's Defenses one year before 9-11, in which they said the process, they, they, visual, they, they, they called for, they've been always calling for the United States to invade Iraq and occupy Iraq. And the document says, they have to, we have to do this whether Saddam Hussein is on the throne or not. Saddam Hussein was not the issue. The issue was occupying Iraq because Iraq was the most advanced Arab country in the region by far. They had the best universities, the best technology, the best medicine. It's an old, old, old culture. It's probably the oldest culture in the world. And they, they said the process of transformation to change this military doctrine, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. So both of these documents who, who, who visualized changing American military policy called for a new Pearl Harbor. That was essential to getting the American public opinion to uh, supporting these radical changes. See, I'm not the radical. You're not the radical. We want, we want America to be like it used to be, slow, conservative, gentle changes through history. But the radical changes we've seen in the, in the last 16 years, they're the radicals. They're the radicals. Now, again, Israeli Mossad controlled security at U.S. airports, all the gateway airports, the international airports on 9-11. Boston's Logan Airport, for example. The, the security was provided by a company called Huntley USA. They were the passenger screening company. Sounds American, right? No, it's owned by this Israeli company, ICTS, which is run by the man in the middle here. Does he look like Itzhak Shamir? It's his son, Yair Shamir. Yair Shamir, the son of Yitzhak Shamir, runs through the 9-11 story like a, red, like a red thread through a fabric. And here's two of his partners, Boaz Harrell and Ed Kuckerman. These are the guys who controlled security at U.S. airports on 9-11. I bet you felt secure then, huh? And what they did is they create false histories for the alleged hijackers. How was that done? Very simple. You get a duplicate license issued for the same name, and then you have an Israeli Hebrew, an Israeli Arabic-speaking actor, young man, playing the role of Muhammad, playing the role of Muhammad Atta, for example. So Muhammad Atta went to get a license, for example, this all happened in Florida. Fifteen of these guys lived in Florida. One guy would go to the DMV on Tuesday, get a license, Muhammad Atta, I live here. The next day, the very next day, it was reported in the, in the papers in Florida, the very next day somebody called and said, hello, I'm Muhammad Atta, and I've moved to a new apartment, can you send me a license to my new address? And DMV said, yeah, sure we will. Just make sure you destroy the old one, okay? Well, what, we, what we have then is you have Muhammad Atta here and Muhammad, Muhammad Atta three blocks away. Who's the real Muhammad? You figure it out. And so while Muhammad Atta is sleeping after reading his Quran, this guy's out at the, at the disco club putting, putting money in the, in the dancer's panties <laughs> and leaving a very loud, I'm Muhammad Atta, I'm a Muslim. I just love to drink vodka and chase women. Well, understanding how duplicate, lice, duplicate documents are used to, to create false histories is very essential to understanding 9-11. This is why that Larry Johnson said this is a very sophisticated crime. Because he knew, we knew right away in the very beginning, seven of these guys were still alive. Six of them had been getting, gotten duplicate licenses. Others had reported lost passports. So there were two people for each identity. It's an old Israeli trick. Here, here we see the BBC News reporting on the 23rd of September, 2001, that seven of these hijackers were still alive. And they're fine. One was living in Saudi Arabia, one's living in Morocco, they're living here and there. Even Muhammad Atta's father said he spoke to Muhammad Atta after the event. And, you know, and then in September, 2002, the head of the FBI, Robert Mueller, he told CNN, there is no legal, no legal proof to prove the identities of the suicidal hijackers. Well, if, if seven of them are still alive, who hijacked the planes? Was the plane, were the planes even hijacked? Was there even hijacking involved? Or is this all just a big show? It's a big show, I tell you, it's all a big show. A big deception. It's like, a, it's like an old-fashioned stage magician trick. Look here. 
But when you understand the trick, the game's over. That's what I'm trying to help you with. Here's the Mossad. The Mossad, this man, John Le Carre, wrote this book about the Mossad in 1982. And in the very beginning, he says he acknowledges the help that he got from Israeli military intelligence. He names the people who helped him. And in this, in this book, this, the basic story, The Little Drummer Girl, is that this English actress helps to lay a false trail for a Palestinian from Turkey to Germany. And they travel across Europe. Then in Germany, the Mossad arranges for a, a spectacle at a synagogue. Explosions go out the windows and things like that. And so people think, oh, the, the synagogue's been bombed. The next day, the Palestinian terrorist is blown up in his car on the Autobahn. End of the story. This is exactly what we're seeing day in and day out in the Middle East. You know, they say, oh, yeah, it was, it was a suicide bomber. I saw him. If you saw the suicide bomber, you would not be around. If you see, yeah, he, he walked in the door and he blew himself up, you would not be in any shape to talk about it. That's what they do. And then in July of 2001, the Zionists, the, the, the pro-Israeli guys, got the lease for the World Trade Center. How that worked. The World Trade Center was public property on 9-11, before 9-11. It belonged to the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Basically, state property, public property of the people of New York and New Jersey. Well, for the plot to go ahead, for the plot to go ahead and succeed, they needed to privatize the, the World Trade Center. And this is how they did it. Ronald Lauder here, the son of Estee Lauder, he was the head of New York State privatization scheme under Governor Pataki. He decided they would privatize the World Trade Center. Well, what's his connection to the Mossad, you might ask? Here it is. You know, he's the son of Estee Lauder. He's got a lot of money. He funds the Lauder School of Government, Diplomacy, and Strategy at Mossad Center, IDC, in Herzliya, Israel, where this Israeli major general, Aluf Daniel, Daniel Rothschild, is heads the Institute for Policy and Strategy. So back in Herzliya, Israel, these two guys have a very close connection. And that's where the idea to privatize the World Trade Center probably came. And when they privatized the World Trade Center, then went to executive director of the Port Authority, this man, Lou Eisenberg, who then oversaw the negotiations that delivered the World Trade Center to Larry Silverstein. Now, what's the connection between these two men? There's more than just a, uh, they have a Zionist connection here. Silverstein and Eisenberg are both on the United Jewish Appeal Board of Directors. Silverstein was the national chairman. Eisenberg is on the planning board. The UJA Federation of New York is probably the most well-endowed um, supplier of funds to the state of Israel in the United States of America. They raise money from Jews in, in New York and other people, and that's where, how they raise the money for the state of Israel. A lot of the money comes from there. And Larry Silverstein was the national chairman. So their Zionist connection is what prevailed here. Larry Silverstein didn't have the money to buy the World Trade Center. He bought the money with about $10 million of his own money down. The rest was borrowed money from GMAC, who went bankrupt in 2008, 2009 under the heads, I think it was American family. Again, unfortunately, there's this, this Zionist element that brought that GMAC down, but it was their borrowed money that bought the World Trade Center. And then Netanyahu and Silverstein were in very close touch with each other. You have to consider that Larry, Larry Silverstein here was, you would say, the godfather of 9-11. All three towers that fell belonged to him. This man, Bibi Netanyahu, is like the godfather of the war on terror. He spent the better part of 30 years promoting the war on terror doctrine. He, he made a career doing that. Well, for years, Netanyahu and Silverstein have kept in very close touch. Every Sunday afternoon, like today, New York time, Netanyahu would call Silverstein. It made no difference where Netanyahu was. He would always call. Their ties continued after Netanyahu became prime minister in 1996. What were they talking about? Baseball scores? Football scores? <laughs> And then on July 24th, 2001, Larry Silverstein got the keys to the World Trade Center. Here's a picture of him with his wife and his lawyer. And on 9-11, his wife was, this was his wife who, who, who he said, um, he was, Larry Silverstein was supposed to be in the windows of the world, at the top of the building. But his wife said he had a dermatologist appointment, he had to go to the doctor. And he was saved, his life was saved by going to the doctor instead of going to the, going to the World Trade Center that day. He said here, I'm so proud to assume the stewardship of the World Trade Center, one of New York's greatest jewels. 
Five weeks later, this is what was left of New York's greatest jewels. Ashes, dust, and steel. Then, as Wesley Clark said, we didn't have American understanding of it. No, we had Israeli understanding of it. And that Israeli understanding of 9-11 came to us from the Israeli highest decorated soldier, Ehud Barak. Ehud Barak just so happened to be in London that day, that morning, happened to be at the BBC World Studio, the largest TV network, English TV network in the world. And he sat down and explained what happened on 9-11 before the towers even fell. He said, the world will never be the same from today on. He said, we know who's behind this. It's Osama bin Laden, the man he trained. We, it's Osama bin Laden, and we know where he is. He's in Afghanistan. He said, now it's time to launch an operational concrete war against terror. That keyword, operational. Everything we do in the war on terror is called Operation This, Operation That, Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Inherent Resolve. They're all operations, very surgical, you know. We, the, the, the world is sick, we have to do an operation here, an operation there, an operation there. That's what we're doing, and killing lots of people. Over one million Muslims have been killed in this war. And when you, when you consider the, in, the, the, the history of American intervention in Iraq, it becomes in the millions since 1991. What's the connection between Ehud Barak and Netanyahu? Well, Ehud Barak here in the sunglasses, speaking very discreetly, was, was Netanyahu's commander in the Sayeret Matkal. That's an Israeli elite group. It's an independent, covert commando force that serves directly under Israeli military intelligence. So when we use the word Mossad, we use it lightly. We use it in, incorrectly. Mossad is one part of Israeli intelligence. Israeli military intelligence is a whole nother entity. And other members of this, of this group were involved in 9-11. For example, sample Daniel Levin, uh, the former head of Amakai, I think it's called. He was on flight 11 that supposedly went into the North Tower, first plane. And then we have the situation that the Israeli deputy prime minister was in New York City on September 10th and September 11th, but it was kept out of the news. He also happened to be the mayor of Jerusalem at the time. His name is Ehud Olmert. He's the man in the NYPD hat. And he was deputy mayor, deputy prime minister of Israel. And he was in New York City on September 10th and 11th. I discovered this in the Israeli newspaper, in the sports page of the Jerusalem Post, because he sold the Beitar football team on September 10th to a bunch of American Israeli Jews in New York. That's where the sale happened. On September 11th, one Israeli plane was allowed to leave from JFK in the afternoon under orders of the Department of Defense. He was on that plane with a lot of his Israeli cronies who were probably all tied into 9-11. Here he is, he just got out of jail. He's been in jail for the last two years in Israel for bribery in Israel. And Netanyahu is also in a whole lot of trouble, but we'll see what happens out of that. But Ehud Olmert, Deputy Prime Minister and Mayor of Jerusalem, was in New York City on September 10th and 11th, but his visit was kept secret. Why? Usually it would be front page news. In this particular case, it was kept completely out of the news. Although the FBI and the New York authorities and New York police and, and, and immigration, they all knew he was here, but the public was kept in the dark. Why? What's up with that? And then there were these five dancing Israelis. You may have heard of them. These are the men who were, who were caught in, in New Jersey having videotaped and photographed and themselves in front of the burning World Trade Center behind them. They were on the New Jersey side of the river and the, the towers were burning and, and being hit by planes and they were high-fiving and I think they were probably wearing Arabic kafiyas because they were reported by Ted Koppel as being five Middle Eastern men were being sought by the FBI for having videotaped and celebrated the collapse in the World Trade Center, the attack on the World Trade Center. That was on noon on September 11th. I turned to my wife, we were driving in Pennsylvania, and said, they could be Israeli. When I got back to Chicago, it turned out they were Israeli. It was reported in the local paper in New Jersey who they were, they were Israelis, the, these two guys on the far side were both Mossad agents, known Mossad agents, they're brothers. But it was never reported in any New York newspaper. Why? Why was it only reported in the Bergen record? You know, and they went back to Israel, and in Israel, the, this one said, our purpose was to document the event. He appeared on Hebrew TV, speaking to Yair Lapid, and said that, just like that. We come from a country that experiences terrorism every day. Our purpose was to document the event. 
Well, who sent him the document to them? They worked for a moving company, a fake moving company in Weehawken, New Jersey, called Urban Moving Systems. And the forward newspaper, the Jewish newspaper in New York, in, in March of 2002, said, this is a complete Mossad front. The people that were working in Urban Moving Systems were there to carry out the 9-11 operation. They weren't moving at all. They didn't move anything. And there are a few American employees in this, in this company, Urban Movie Systems, and they were shocked by what they saw. When 9-11 happened, they said the Israelis were all cheering and, and, and happy. And they said they couldn't understand it. They were crying. And these Israelis were like celebrating. What's up? They didn't know who they were working for. Then there's this little operation that thousands of Israelis were thought to be missing from the World Trade Center on 9-11. 4,000 Israeli families called the Department of Foreign Ministry asking about their loved one because they were supposed to be in the area of the World Trade Center of the Pentagon at the time of the attack. Of the 4,000 Israelis who were thought to be in danger that day, four died. How did they survive? How did they have such good uh, survival rate? They got the memo. They got the Odigo memo. Odigo was an uh, Israeli instant messaging service that you could get, you could receive the messages coming through your uh, Blackberry, your Blueberry, your, your internet, email, what have you. It's called Odigo. And Several hours before the attack, a message went out in Hebrew to all the people who got Odigo, saying basically, all hell is going to break loose at the World Trade Center at 8.45 this morning. Do, go someplace else. And so they, they, avoided, they avoided harm by not going to the World Trade Center that day. And the, president, the vice president of the company, his name was Alex Diamandis, he told the press, he said, the, the warnings were accurate to the minute, meaning 8.45. 845, something's going to happen, don't go. And then there's a question about these put options. These are stock trades, option trades, made by people who thought that United Airlines and American Airlines stock would plummet that day. People made bets, big bets, according to this. It's, it's an options trade. And we found out from the 9-11 Commission report that a single US-based in, in, institutional investor with no conceivable ties to Al-Qaeda purchased 95% of these United Airlines puts on September 6th. And then we find out who that, who that company was. It's a company called Alex Brown, and it was headed by this man until 1997. On 9-11, this man was the executive director of the CIA. His name is um, Buzzy Krongord. Don't be deceived by the kind of Danish-sounding name. It's a fake name that they, they took when they came to the United States from Poland. He's, he's a Jewish man from Poland. His family came from Poland. And to the embarrassment of investigators, it has emerged that the firm used to buy many of the put options was headed until 1998 by Buzzy Krongord, now executive director of the CIA. Until 1997, Krongord was chairman of Alex Brown, an investment banking firm with ties to Israeli military intelligence and Yair Shamir's company, Cytex. Yair Shamir pops up all the time. Son of a gun. Cytex, Cytex is his company. Well, we have, have, you have to read chapter seven in, the, in, in my book, Solving 9-11. That's where the whole, whole network is laid out, called the architecture of terror. Here we have Alvin Krongord, Al, you know, the guy, the CIA executive director. The executive director position no longer exists at the CIA, but at the time, the executive director of the CIA was the guy who ran day-to-day -day operations of the CIA. So Tenet is like the figurehead. He's the fancy guy, the political guy. The guy who actually ran the operations was Buzzy Krongord. So he knew something was coming along. Here we see Alvin Krongord, he's there. He's married to Cheryl Gordon, that's his wife. And she works for Rothschild Asset Management. Again, you always find the Rothschilds one step removed from the culprit. And then the 9-11 investigation, or more accurately, the non-investigation. Because many people say, new investigation 9-11. Let's have a, a new invest. They're mistaken. There never was an investigation. We're not asking for a new investigation, we're asking for an investigation. Because rather than investigating the crime, we went to war, remember? There was no investigation. They were destroying the evidence 24-7 from day one. And the person who was behind the supposed investigation was this man. He's an Israeli son of the Mossad. His name is Michael Sheratov. On 9-11, this is the man who prosecuted the first bombing in 1993 in New Jersey. Here he was, now he was Assistant Secretary, Assistant Attorney General Criminal Division, Department of Justice. He was the one who would have been the, would have prosecuted the crimes of 9-11 had there been any crimes prosecuted. 
He instead oversaw the destruction of the evidence. And his, his, his mom was uh, the, one of the first Mossad agents. So John Ashcroft, Attorney General, put, put Sheratov in charge of the 9-11 investigation, and for day-to-day -day decisions, Sheratov had the last word. And then George Bush appointed Michael Sheratov to head Homeland Security in March of 2005. In this position, he maintained his control over the investigation, over the evidence, so that for the better part of 10 years after 9-11, he oversaw all control and access to the evidence of 9-11. One man and an Israeli citizen. Israeli citizen in charge of our criminal division in the United States. And here we have then Zionists managed the destruction of the, of the evidence. This evidence, this tons and tons of steel, was taken from day one to two Zionist junkyards in New Jersey, one of which had just become a Zionist junkyard in the, in the previous few months. And these junkyards were all prepared to take the steel. They had crews working 24-7, 12-hour shifts, cutting the steel into pieces five feet and shorter, mixing with other scrap, and shipping it to China. And they had, they, had, they had dredged, they had paid millions of dollars to dredge the Claremont Channel to facilitate large vessels taking the stuff to China in the months prior to 9-11. And the guy that, that, that created the network that facilitated the transfer of the steel was none other than Mark Rich, the criminal who, who, who Bill Clinton pardoned in his last day of office, the Zionist agent in, in Switzerland, Mark Rich. So they had to destroy all the steel. The reason, and, and you have to understand, they were taking the steel from these Zionist junkyards, cutting it into pieces, and sending it to China. When, when the price of, of steel, of junk steel, was the lowest it had been in 50 years. It was $50 a ton. It was really low. And they were paying $25 a ton to ship it to China. So they made no money. What, was, what were they doing it for? The whole purpose was to destroy the evidence. If, you, if the steel is so cheap, you would, you would basically just put it in a yard someplace and wait for the price to go up. And then sell it to the guys in Pennsylvania or Indiana or West, West Virginia, where you're paying only a few dollars to move it a ton. Instead, they, they paid all this money because they were destroying the evidence because the steel had telltale marks that showed what happened. And then the Zionists presided over the 9-11 litigation, the tort litigation, the, the lawsuits that resulted. And this is Alvin, Alvin K. Hellerstein. He's a conservative Zionist judge from Manhattan. And I discovered that his son, Joseph, is a lawyer in Israel, and that his son worked for a law firm that represented the key defendant in the 9-11 tort litigation, ICTS, that company in Holland again, that company that oversaw passenger screening and airport security at Boston's Logan Airport, ICTS. And this is a, a called a primary family conflict of interest. It's not kosher. You cannot have a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter who work for a defendant in a case that you're presiding over. Didn't make any difference to these guys. This is the situation. Joey over here in Israel is a lawyer in Israel. This is his dad. And Joe is an Israeli lawyer with a firm that represents Kukerman, parent company of ICTS. Kukerman is also CEO of Rothschild Group and chairman of Israel General Bank. You see, the, Rothschild, the Rothschilds are always like one step removed from the crime itself. These are those three men that I showed you before, Yair Shamir, Ed Kukerman, and Boaz Harel. And how it worked, we're getting almost done now here. This is, the, this is how they dealt with the, the victims of 9-11. There were 3,000 families who lost somebody on 9-11, roughly, about 3,000 people. The first 2,900 were dealt with and settled in out-of-court settlements by this man, Kenny Feinberg. He was the special master of the 9-11 Compensation Fund. And, and he basically gave money to the first 2,900 families who, who agreed they would take the money, they signed a non-disclosure statement that they would not, never talk about the terms of the agreement, and they would never litigate further. They were, they were forbidden from litigating. So they took the money from Ed, and Kenneth Feinberg. But Kenneth Feinberg is an interesting guy. He's always special master. Whenever there's money to be dealt out, Kenny Feinberg's the guy. Feinberg's wife, who works with him in this, op, in the, in this, in this business, is executive of the United, United Israel Appeal, and Jewish Federation of Washington. And she sits on the Board of Governors of the Jewish Agency, which is the highest agency in the, in the Zionist enterprise in the United States of America. That's at the absolute apex of the pyramid. And, and so he took care of the first. Then there were 96 families left. You all know some of these families. The Davis family, for example, from Boston. They were, they were one of the last families that were settled. 
he was a hockey scout for the LA Kings, I think it was. Well, Sheila Birnbaum, she was the special mediator who worked with Judge Hellerstein. And they had 96 families in, in, the, in the courtroom for New York who wanted a day in court. They wanted a justice. They wanted to know who was to be held accountable for the loss of their loved one. And one by one, every one of those families was settled out of court by her, Sheila Birnbaum. She happens to be a partner with Skadden Arps, a law firm with very close ties to Israel. And she arranged the outer court settlements for 96 families who had refused to take the compensation from Feinberg. So what we've had is we've had the worst case of mass murder in this country, which was never investigated, all the evidence was destroyed, and the victims have never had a day in court. That's justice. We, 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 we watch TV shows. We live in a fantasy land in this country. We watch TV shows, crime scene, Navy crime scene investors, CSI, where they solve these very complicated crimes with using the latest technology. It's all BS. The FBI doesn't investigate anything. The FBI creates terrorism sting operations. And it, like Judge Napolitano said, it's like all of the, all of the, terror, the terror operations the FBI has solved were operations that they themselves created. So we, we're living in a situation where the FBI is not solving crimes, they're perpetrating crimes and covering up crimes like 9-11. We're, we're in deep doo-doo. So this is the end of the program, basically. This is Judge Mukasey. He belongs to the same synagogue, the same Zionist congregation, Kahilat Jasharun. It's a Zionist conservative synagogue, Orthodox synagogue in Manhattan. He presided over the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, where, 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 um, at, where um, Sheratov was the prosecutor. And he also presided over Silverstein's battle with the insurance company, where Silverstein said, it's two attacks, it's two attacks. Because he had signed it, he had, he had created an a insurance contract with the insurance companies where for the first time in history, he was insured against terrorist attacks. He said, it's two attacks. And he got double indemnity, $4.55 billion for his $10 million they put down. And Bibi Netanyahu, the head of Israeli government, admitted that 9-11 benefits Israel. On 9-11, he said, it's very good. It'll generate immediate sympathy. He said this on the day when 30,000 people were thought to be in the rubble. 30,000 people were thought to be in the rubble, and he said, it's very good. Who would say it's very good except somebody who saw some benefit from 9-11? And he saw benefit in speaking in Hebrew at Bar Ilan University in 2008. He said that the 9-11 terror attacks are good for Israel. He said in Hebrew, we are benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and American struggle in Iraq. Those are three things there. But in his mind, it's one thing. That's a Freudian slip. And then the Zionists control the 9-11 myth. What, the legacy. What the children learn when they, go to the, when they go to the memorial. First of all, Zelikow, Philip Zelikow wrote the 9-11 Commission report. Philip Zelikow, who has a degree, has a PhD from Rice University, his thesis was on the creation and maintenance of the public myth. He wrote this 9-11 Commission report. Philip Zelikow had completed the outline of the 9-11 Commission report before the staff even began working. And he had, he had the chapter titles, the subtitles, and the sub-subtitles all there. Then you just pin in the evidence that you need, and presto, there you have the myth. And the people who worked on it, like the senior counsel, they worked on the commission, they said what the government and military officials told Congress, the commission, the media, and the public about who knew what when was almost entirely and inexplicably untrue. The, the, Thomas Keene, who was the co-chairman with Lee Hamilton said, to this day, we don't know why NORAD told us what they told us. It was just so far from the truth. NORAD was, of course, the North American air defense system that failed spectacularly on 9-11. Fighters were sent from Otis Air Force Base by Cape Cod to New York City, and they went out over the Atlantic Ocean. What happened there? Well, they couldn't explain it. They didn't want to explain it, and they lied. And then the Israelis constructed the memorial in New York City. This man, the World Trade Center Memorial was designed by the Israeli Michael Arad, the son of Moshe Arad, the former Israeli ambassador to the United States. So you see a very small group of people at the top of the Israeli military intelligence political spectrum have dominated the entire saga. Now, this is not meant to be anti-Semitic. This is not hateful of any ethnic group or religious group. It's simply pointing out the people that are most closely connected to the crime in one way or another. Here's Mayor Bloomberg and, and Israeli, Mayor, Israeli leader Netanyahu discussing the Israeli names of the 9-11 memorial, all four of them. 
And then the Zionist media has ignored 9-11 evidence, as I showed you before. They, didn't talk about, they don't talk about the molten steel for 16 years, molten metal. Because if they talk about the molten metal, people will say, well, what did that come from? That doesn't fit. So they don't put it in there. They leave it out. This is how they do it. The New York Times, three years after 9-11, this is the paper of the Salzburger Ox family, a leading Zionist family in the, in the B'nai B'rith, one of the founding members of, founding families of Lodge Number 1 B'nai B'rith, New York City. The, their lead editorial, three years later on 9-11, they said, in the three years since 9-11, we've begun to understand that it's possible to know what happened without knowing what happened. Full stop. <laughs> That's all you need to know. So for 15 years, the control media, 16 years now, the media have pushed a false narrative about 9-11 and the war on terror, all the while suppressing the real evidence that disproves the official myth. Today in this little presentation, I've just given you some of the evidence. There's a lot more in my books, the Solomon 9-11 books, but that's 10 years, that's 12 years of research, and I can't present that in one hour. If you want to know and understand, you have to read the book. But this is basically the conclusion here. This is from Dr. Alan Sabrosky. He's the man who wrote the foreword to this book. Um, he, he said in 2009, the evidential trail for 9-11 and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq runs from PNAC, APAC, Israeli-American lobby, and their cohorts, through the mostly Jewish neocons, I showed you those guys in the Bush administration, excuse me, and back to the Israeli government. None of the denials and political machinations can alter that essential reality. And so here we are. This is the final slide. I want you to go away from this presentation tonight not feeling glum, not feeling pessimistic, but feeling relieved because you have been relieved, or I've tried to relieve you, disabuse you of a deception. The word to be removed from a deception is to disabuse a person because a person who is, a, who is deceived is abused. So when you disabuse a person of deception, you should feel relieved that the war on terror and 9-11 are nothing more than a fancy deception. That, you, that, has, that has bamboozled the whole nation. We live in a deceived nation. You, however, have the antidote. And the only way to defeat deception is to increase awareness of the truth. So what we need to do is when you, if you, if you get this little book, I have this little book for $10. This is, the, this is my War on Terror book. This is what talks about the War on Terror and 9-11, the basic deception of these things. When you understand we've been deceived, that's the key to get out. Because when we reach you might think this is a small group of people, but these kinds of videos reach thousands of people like he's making today. I did an interview with, I did an interview in, in, in California a couple weeks ago, over 100,000 people have seen it. So on the internet, we have the internet to use. People are becoming aware of this deception and it's reaching thousands and thousands of people. And when enough people understand the deception, the game is over. So I want to thank you very much for coming. And we can now have open the discussion to Q&A. And I wanted to pass my... I'm, I, I want to pass my hat around. This is just if you'd like to donate some money for my traveling fund, I'd appreciate it. So I'll pass it to you first. Catch. And pass it around. And, and Yes, sir. He's got a question there. Do you want, to ask, you want them to ask questions from the microphone here? Yes. So come up and speak to the microphone so that you can get you on tape or... With your very damning report on uh, the official story of 9-11 and its aftermath, uh, the war in the Middle East, <clears throat> uh, how does the FBI allow you to do this? Have you ever been threatened by the FBI? Okay. Um, I, I live in Sweden for a reason. I live in Sweden because I was attacked by an undercover tactical unit at my house. After we made the discovery of nanothermite, after we discovered the thermite, and when I, dis I wrote about the iron boiling under the World Trade Center, my newspaper cut my allowance to nothing. I had to go home where there were four people who had befriended me who told me they were informants for the FBI. I think they told me this in order to scare me, in order to scare me off so that I would um, stop doing what I was doing. Because the discovery of nanothermite was not supposed to happen. When that happened, the cat was out of the bag, you see? The 9-11 story falls apart with the evidence. So then um, I, I went home where I knew we were not safe. We knew we were being surveilled. The surveillance increased. Then I was attacked by an undercover unit. The, the man who led the unit was also an agent of Homeland Security. So 
I was criminalized. I was, I was in court in Cook County, Illinois. I had a four-day trial. Finally, it took a long time. CNN came, to, C CNN came to visit me in Schaumburg, and they made a hit piece. And they aired the hit piece on the Paula Zan show the night before I was supposed to go on trial. And then I was, I, I, they had a hung jury. The, the judge was a Zionist. The clerk was a Zionist. And the prosecutor was a Zionist. And they went back with special instructions. They came back with two guilty conviction on both counts. And we, we simply made a strategic retreat and went to Europe. So are there any people or organizations that are defending you on a regular basis? No, no organizations. Um, I'm an individual. I don't work for any organization. I haven't worked for an organization since 2007, uh, 2006. So I've been independent ever since then. But I've always been independent as a journalist. When I worked for that newspaper in Washington, D.C., I could write whatever I wanted. They would sometimes take some of the material out of my articles, but I was completely independent. So but no, but no, no organization helps me. Nobody helps me at all. So that's why I ask for donations, because um, I do this on my own nickel and, and people who donate generously so that I can do this. This is the sixth time I've toured in America. And I do it because if we want this country to survive in, in any shape or form as it, as it should be, we have to stop this war. We have to stop the war because the war will destroy this nation. The war destroyed the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, and it'll destroy this nation as well. Uh, so are you, do you have copies of your book here? For yes, I do. I do. So after this, we'll sit down at the table, and I, I can sign copies of this book. I sell this book for $10. So we can deal with it afterwards. Thank you. Question? Come up to the microphone. Whoever has got the next question. She has a question. Or oh, you have a question? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the rich uh, presentation you just gave. I got a couple of questions. The first one is, are you a US citizen, number two? Why are you doing this, number three? Uh, how far is Zionism itself penetrated into the US? Thank you. OK. His first question is, I'm an American citizen. Yes, I'm an American citizen, born in Chicago. Second question is, why am I doing this? I, as I explained earlier, this war on terror and 9-11 are deceptions. And, and it, is in, it is imperative that the American people understand the deception. The mass media will never make this clear. The mass media is part of the problem. So we are living under the spell of an evil mass media and a hijacked government. The only way that the truth will reach the American people is if I spread the truth and other people spread this message. That's the only way we can defeat deception. And your third question is, how deeply has Zionism infiltrated the US government? Completely, at every level. I, just for example, in Texas, I just came from Texas, and they, you know, they had a terrible flood, Hurricane Harvey down there. And the people in Houston have been inundated with this high water. Their houses are wrecked. You know, American houses don't take high water. Drywall and plaster, it's, it's no good. It's mold. So you have to rebuild the whole house, actually. So the people in Houston, Texas, who appeal for state aid have to sign an agreement that they will not boycott Israel for the entire term of the contract. And they have never boycotted Israel to, the, to this point. Because in, in Texas, there's a state law. I think there's also in, uh, in some other states, Colorado, perhaps, maybe New York, that you cannot, no state money can be spent on any agency or any person who boycotts Israel. So the Texas flood victims have to forswear that they will not boycott Israel for the term of the contract. What, what, this is outrageous. This is outrageous. So you, you want to see how, far, how deeply Israel? My friend in Texas told me that there are Israeli Knesset members in the state capitol building in Austin, Texas, writing law. They obviously wrote that law. Next question. Come on up, come, come to the mic. The next yeah. Some people that, that are leaving that want to get the book. You oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Let's, yeah, sure. Let's sign them. Let's, yeah, I can, get, I can get some books here. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, you can, okay. But make sure that you get, you get from each book, if they want a signature, they have to wait for a signature. But here you go. They're $10 each. Okay, thanks. Okay, next question. Yeah, come to the microphone, please. Oh, I just wanted to um, say I'm sorry that I haven't, can you hear me? I hear you. 
Um, I haven't kept up close touch with the truth movement, but I was, I've been waiting all these years for some sort of tribunal to sort of act as a, a yeah. kind of cleansing moment. Yeah. And I've, I've sort of been online talking to Dr. Fetzer. Yeah. And lately I've been really disappointed because with this Las Vegas event, yeah. you know, he was really quick to say, this is a hoax. Right. And so now I think it's, it's hard to even think straight because so many people are accusing so many people, people of crimes. Mm -hmm. And we all know, everybody knows that somewhere in the background, it's the old Jewish problem. <laughs> and also, you know, I think, the issue of the Rothschilds, Richard Grove is doing a lot of research on the Rothschilds mm -hmm. right now. Their control of the genie, what is it? That genie oil. Oil yeah. is, is really core to this. Yeah. So, so how can people start feeling like they can create public forums where uh. they can hang together? Well, they have to create public forums. Like this public forum was created by Mark Mohammed. Mark Mohammed set this up after I came to Boston last month. And, and you know, we, but we need to, like I said, create forums, create, create tribunals. We've been trying to do that for a long time, but we don't have subpoena power. We can't, we can't, you know, arrest, we can't go down to Waco, Texas and arrest George Bush and take him away from his painting easel. We can't arrest Dick Cheney or Michael Sheratoff or John Ashcroft or any of these people who are involved in the crime. That's what has to happen. We have to have political will to arrest the culprits of 9-11 that are living amongst us. And that'll only, that'll require, that will require a political revolution in this country. Because as I said, currently the culprits of 9-11 control, they are the hijackers of this nation. This nation's been hijacked. And we can't sit back and think that we're on a plane that's been hijacked and it's gonna go someplace we wanna go. It's not going where we wanna go. We have to, we have to, put away our champagne, undo our seatbelt, and take control of our country. We have to take ownership of this country. This is our country. This is the United States of America. The people are sovereign, not the gangsters. Any more questions? You got one. Rachel, how are you doing? Good, thank you, how are you? Good, thanks. I, I am confused on how to deal with this Zionist issue because I've been doing some research on it and it goes back centuries, maybe millenniums, in which the um, Zionists who, um, they go by the Talmud mm -hmm. and the Talmud directly promotes that the Jewish are the most special people and the rest of us are no more than cows or chickens, we're just livestock to them. Okay. So killing us is like killing a cow or right. a chicken. And, right. and our attitude towards killing cows and chickens is pretty, I would say questionably cruel. Mm -hmm. So they are cruel to us as we would be cruel to chickens and cows. Right. And so in addition, I've been looking at books by people like Henry Ford and Lewis Eustace Mullins and Checked right. a little bit into Martin Luther, and the mentality that they see is that the Jewish, the Zionist Jewish people, I don't want to say Jewish, because the Zionist people have treated the Jewish as badly as they've treated right. us. Right, Which I right. really grasped right. from Shahak the other day, right. reading, and we see the Jewish people working for money, 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 but it turns out that money, money, money is for the rabbis. Right. And keeping them in style. Right. So, but anyway, it comes down to how to deal with this Zionist agenda right. that goes back maybe millenniums without ending up being, quote, anti-Semitic, which are not right. even Semitic. Right. It's, right. So they have a cow, they control the language in a way that kind right. of creates right. a conundrum. Well, well like, uh, the thing is, is that, you know, on this tour in, in this city, for example, I did an interview with a man named Ahmed from the radio station in Northeastern. Mm -hmm. We discussed 9-11 and we discussed some other things. He was an African speaker, very knowledgeable about African situation. And, and he, was, he, was, uh, he was suspended from his program by the radio station and, and they said he had involved, been involved in hate speech.
Right. And now the thing is, you have to understand, is that this is not hateful right. to discuss this. To, to, to solve a crime is not hateful. It's not like, it's the same thing I, I, I compare if you're an Italian. If you're an Italian, if you're an Italian, you, you don't support the mafia simply because there are other Italians. Right. You support the mafia if you're a fellow mafioso. Right. But if you, just because you don't, you don't support the mafia because you're Italian, you share, you, know, you share a culture of Italian heritage. Likewise, American Jews are very unwise to be supporting the cover-up of 9-11, thinking that they're protecting other Jews. Because it's not unfair to point out these people. The fact that they're Jews is not my decision. They themselves, this is, this is a very small group of people, a subset of a subset of Zionism. Okay. And, and, but but it's, it's, what I'm saying is that for an American Jew to, or for people to support the 9-11 crime and support the cover-up of the crime because of their ethnicity or their perceived ethnicity ties, ethnic ties to the culprits is very foolish. Okay, but I read <coughs> Jim Stone, yeah. who was a Jewish man, okay. convert for a while, he's a journalist, okay. and he had a very intense experience doing this conversion, Yeah. because when you go to a Jewish synagogue, if you are a guest, their language is very different than if you're uh, not a guest. Right. And if against, not, against Zionism, you mean? No, the way they, they run, their own, <coughs> run, run their business, okay. their temple. Okay. So if you're a guest... The topics are different than if you're not a guest. A guest. A guest. Yeah. Guest. A guest. I see. Yeah, guest. So if you're not a guest, there's scheming. Sure. Going down within the temple. Sure. Against the rest of humanity. Sure. And so then I'm not sure exactly what the percentage of the Jewish is, people who participate in this scheme against the rest of humanity. Right. And I'm pretty sure that's happening because I live in Boston. Right, right. I've spent time in the court system trying to protect my friend who's a man, and the court systems have been destroying the men, literally. Right. Destroying the family, denying right. their ch children their father. Right. And, and then, of course, you have Common Core. And right. That. Well, I can, I can, That's I, a lot of people involved, not I, just five. I can, I can explain, that, you know, I can understand your, the predicament. The thing is basically like this, is that, you know, if you read the Bible, what Jesus Christ said about, about the scribes and the Pharisees, he condemned them. He said that he basically called them the, the spawn of Satan, that, they, that, they, that their, their father was the devil. They only knew lies. They didn't know the truth if it hit him upside of the head. And he said that you, you, you only know the lies because you're the sons and daughters of the devil. That's pretty strong stuff. They don't read it in church every Sunday. Right. And, and, and there's other writings in the Bible that, that say the same thing, that this is the synagogue of Satan right. in Revelation. This is because the, this is what he's talking about is the scribes and Pharisees he was referring to were the people who were rewriting Mosaic law. They were the rabbis who were writing the, Babylon, or the, the, the Palestinian Talmud, which was the first Talmud. Then they wrote the Babylonian Talmud. And what the Babylonian Talmud does is it stands the, the law of Moses on its head, very much the way the Schofield Bible turns the Bible on its head. So it's the corruption of Scripture. Yeah, it hasn't happened in Islam. It hasn't happened to the Quran, to my understanding. But this is under this you have to understand that these these rabbis and and the Talmud negates Mosaic law. So this is this is a problem for Jewish people. There's there's a large group of Jewish people who do not subscribe to the Talmud. But the Talmud is the noxious element. And it's in, in, in schools across this country, yeshivas are getting state money, federal money, and they're teaching Jewish supremacism, which is the essence of the Talmud. Now, if, if you had a school that taught black supremacism or white supremacism in the school as a subject, it would be closed down. But the Jewish yeshivas are doing a booming business. And they teach, they, 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 they teach this noxious doctrine to young Jewish kids that you are Jewish and you are chosen and you are supreme over the non-Jews, the goyim. And I've lived in Israel. I know this. It's the first thing you feel when you come to Israel as an 18-year-old kid. You feel this kind of like chauvinism where you're not Jew and you're, you're lesser than we are. And this is, this, this, is, this is bad code. It's bad code. It simply has to be you know, abolished. Can I ask a couple more questions? No, well, let somebody else might have a question. So I just want to just take this time again to thank you very much. I said, thank let's you, give Chris a warm round of applause. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
I want to say again to all of us and those that are watching via live stream or will get the video to encourage us all to really get behind this. And as you said, this is not about anti-Semitism. This is about pointing out crimes against America and against humanity. Right. And the main thing that I like to press is that these crimes are being committed in our name. And exactly. so if we do not want to reap the consequence of the actions of those criminals that are acting on our name, then we need to stand against them in a country that's supposed to be a democracy or as they like to say, a government of the people and for the people. Right. We have to stand up because they're doing this in our name. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, I don't even know if I need this, but uh, Mr. Bowman, thank you so much for yeah. your presentation. Uh, thank you to uh, Muhammad's Moss number 11 for uh, bringing this to the community. I yeah. wish more of us were here. Right. Uh, I'm a firefighter, I'm a Boston firefighter, been here for 15 years. It's very interesting how even in the training, our training, um, the political disposition of those who dictate policy on the Boston Fire Department are, are, is woven into our understanding of, and, and you can understand how this is a seminal um, piece of example yes. for, for our training. And I just would, I came in kind of late. I wanted to go over, or wanted you to go over again, the, uh, the theory behind the, the molten steel. Yeah. And because that's one of the major things that we, they talk about when we talk about um, uh, an event. Right, like like nine eleven. Right. Hopefully, nothing like that will ever happen again. But right. um, from our perspective, the maintaining of uh, of life safety number one. Hours what do they tell you at the Boston Fire Department about uh, the molten steel? What are the, where do they? How do they explain it? Fuel engine, fuel engine, uh, jet jet fuel engines absolutely melted all the steel. It rained. Yes, oh, absolutely. And they say that there was um, uh, yeah, it just yeah. Couldn't, the yeah. steel couldn't maintain its integrity. Right. You know, because the fuel engine, the engine fuel burns. Okay. So high. It was like five hundred something kilo uh -huh. you know, or whatever. Right. It was. Right. But um, so so if you could go over the sure. steel one more sure. time, and also sure. just uh, you know, I, I lend credence to people like Noam Chomsky at times, yeah. and, and um, um, uh, Craig Hewitt. Yeah. So do you, any correlation between what you've done and then maybe some of the things that they talk about? Well, I. I folks want some more books. Oh yeah, sure. They might be leaving. I don't want you to miss. Yeah, that. sure, sure. You're doing a great job. I appreciate it. Here you go. Here's um, this. Okay, thanks. And I got more. Okay. The first thing was I. I don't know uh, Hewlett, Craig Hewlett. I think you said I don't know him, and Chomsky. Of course, I'm familiar with his work a little bit. Um, he, he says nothing about 9-11. He poo-poo's the 9-11 thing. He poo-poo's the understanding of nanothermite. He said in Florida, I don't know what that is. You don't know what that is. You know, basically he supports the official story. So I wrote to him, I said, because uh, he, I, he, I think he's actually working for psychological, British psychological warfare, Tavistock. I think he's been working for a long time in that because for him, for him to... Tavistock Institute, for him to turn against the 9-11 truth, for him not to see 9-11 truth at the end of his life is very odd. Um, but you, but you, you said about the Boston firefighters, you have kind of this in, interpretation of 9-11. I have gone with Rudy Dent to Company 52 in Riverdale, I think it's Riverside, Riverdale, New York, where his old company was. And he was, he was asking them about if there's been any changes in firefighting pr protocol, procedures, as a result of 9-11. And there aren't. Um, and I asked the fire, the chief there who was on duty that day, I said, I can understand that you've been under a lot of political pressure from the mayor's office and, and others not to talk about what happened on 9-11. And he says, you got that right. And it's because, so that they've been talked to. They, they understand it's a fraternity. It's like a, a, a paramilitary organization and there's a command structure and you do not talk. And they even seen it in San Diego. Adam Green went down there and talked to firefighters in San Diego. And there again, mum is the word about 9-11. But he found one Hispanic firefighter. He asked him, you know, do you guys talk about it? And the fi Hispanic firefighter said, yeah, we talk about it all the time. And then his, his, his captain got in front of him and like, mum's the word. 
Oh, he shut up. He shut up then. But the thing is, is that about the molten, molten iron, you know, as I showed you in this presentation, you might have missed that. It's in the very beginning. There was a lot of molten metal. I mean, pouring off the building for seven minutes before South Tower. It cascaded like Victoria Falls, hot, white hot molten iron. And that cannot be produced by burning jet fuel. So that was on WABC TV. And, and, and it's, discussed in, it's discussed in the FEMA report. They talk about there would be a puff of white smoke coming out at 10.03.07, and then followed by an increased flow of the metal. We're talking about thermite reactions going off inside the building. That's what produces molten iron, not burning jet fuel. That's why it's not talked about. Well, in, in this case, it's not the South Tower, that floor where the plane went in, it went right into the computer room, the big computer floor, a reinforced floor of computer batteries and computer servers belonging to Fuji Bank. The New York Times won't tell you that. I found out that by doing some research. And then a guy who worked for Fuji Bank called me and he said, he said the, the summer before 9-11, they would roll in these big black boxes, these huge black, huge things. And he said they were told that these were backup batteries for the computer system. They were brought in at night under the cover of darkness and put on the computer floor. And he said the weird thing was they were told they were batteries, but they were never plugged in because those were the large boxes of thermite. And when the, when the missile went through there, it detonated all this stuff, and this stuff burned and, and, and created this pool, pool of molten iron on the 81st, 82nd, 80, 81st floor. Then that floor buckled, and then that's what poured off the building for the seven minutes because it just poured off the building. What does this tell us about, about the, the temperatures above the 82nd floor? It tells us that the temperature on the 82nd floor was at least 1,500 degrees Celsius. It meant that the people above, the people who were trapped above the 82nd floor of the South Tower were being cooked alive, which is why they jumped to their deaths. 250 people at least jumped to their deaths. They, they went to the windows, busted out the windows, they waved the red, the white fabric, hoping that somebody would rescue them. The doors to the roof were locked, like the old Iroquois theater disaster in Chicago, I think it was, where they'd locked, the, in old days, they'd locked the theater doors. The fire hit the theater, the people couldn't get out, they all died. Here again, they locked the doors to the roof. The American military had the wherewithal to land helicopters on the roof, bust the doors open, and, and pull the people out like they did in Saigon from the US Embassy. But they didn't do it. Why didn't they? No attempt was made to rescue the people. And the 2,600 people that died on 9-11 mostly were trapped above the crash zones where they were cooked alive. I wrote about it. I called it an American Holocaust. Because it was an example of a massive sacrifice of human lives in a fire. So we do have to wrap it up. Okay. And, um, Thank so you very much. Mr. Bullman will be here to sign books and pick yeah. up books. And I'll sign books right here. I have a whole box. Anybody wants a book, come out up here and I'll sign a book for you. All right. Thank you. Let's give him another warm round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. You, have, you only have one book. I have more books. Yeah, I only have, I only have the one book. Yeah, I only.